we're we're gonna we're gonna get started. Uh, I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, for those that that didn't get uh, get a program, there is a prog there's programs for this particular session on the back table there. Uh, my name is Dave Donaldson. I work for the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, and and uh, I appreciate y'all coming uh, to the commission meeting as 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 uh, as well as this session. And welcome to Mobile, Alabama. Uh, over the, the past several years, we, we have held general sessions on a variety of topics ranging from economics, ROV monitoring, oil spill, uh, oysters, and, and, and recreational fishing. Uh, at this meeting, uh, we'll be addressing uh, diamondback terrapins uh, and its interactions with the blue crab fishery. Um, there's there's be a number of presentations that, that, uh, that will examine this issue and uh, we're hoping that, that uh, this type of collaboration will begin to change the, the, the tone regarding interactions between the, the industry and, and, and terrapins. Um, as I said, we'll have a panel of, of, of uh, presenters and I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Christina Mormon, uh, who will be facilitating the session and, and gonna, gonna kick us off. So welcome and, and uh, uh, enjoy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're really excited to have this session this morning. I want to thank Steve for organizing this and getting everything going. Um, there have been a lot of conversations over the past couple of years between all of us about terrapins and blue crabs, and I think it's a really great opportunity to have everyone in the same place at the same time so that we can continue the conversation. I'm going to give a really brief introduction to the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group for those of you who aren't familiar, and Steve's going to give a brief introduction to the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission for those of you that aren't familiar with that organization, and then we're going to go into our presentations this morning. Can you click me forward? Or is there a clicker? Oh, I see it. Perfect. So like I said, this is going to be really quick. Um, there we go. So the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group is an organization that's dedicated to Diamondback Terrapin research, conservation, management, and education. It was formed in 2004 and is comprised of people who are generally interested in Diamondback Terrapins from a variety of backgrounds, including the research community, um, the education community, and the management community. So that includes academics, that includes scientists, includes folks from state and federal agencies, uh, from nonprofit organizations. It's a very broad organization with members all over the country, and it includes a number of student researchers as well who are working on diamondback terrapins. Um, membership is open to anyone who has an interest in terrapins. So that includes everyone in this room. Um, the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group is structured as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're run by an executive committee, officers, and regional representatives from our five regions. And the thing that I want to emphasize here is that there are no paid staff for the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group, so everyone who's involved um, does it on their own time over and above everything else that they do. And so I think it's really impressive the number of things that we can do um, as a voluntary organization. The Diamondback Terrapin Working Group is broken into five different regions. Um, so these regions are based on the range of Diamondback Terrapins. So this um, pretty much shows you the entire range for Terrapins as well. There are 16 states along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. Um, the Gulf region includes Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And then we also have participants from Florida as well. Um, so what do we do and how do we do it? Um, we have regional meetings, and then every three years we all come together for a national meeting. Our most recent meeting was last year in Fairhope, Alabama. Um, we have several different ways for sharing information with our members, including um, a newsletter that comes out twice a year, Facebook, we have a listserv that's very active, and then we're also working on some other ways to improve communication for the working group. Um, and then we also have an annual grants program that funds Diamondback Terrapin research and um, other activities across the range.
So when we get together every three years for our national meeting, we set um, three-year goals. And currently things that we're working on are identifying priority terrapin research, conservation, and management issues. And then from there, we want to develop a series of goals to work on moving forward over the next three years. Um, another thing that we plan to do is to develop a webinar series to share information about our grant-funded projects and other terrapin research and management activities that are going on throughout the range. Um, that's something that we hope to get going in the near future. And then we also um, took some time to review our grant award structure and rearrange that a little bit last year to improve the quality of applications and the quality of projects that we were funding. And our ongoing goal is to be recognized as the current incredible source for information on terrapins for the scientific community and the general public. And that's it. So like I said, I wanted to keep it really brief so that we can get into the talks. Um, I should have introduced myself, I guess. I jumped right in. Um, I'm the senior co-chair for the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group, and I also work as the program coordinator for the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. Um, Steve, do you want to take a few minutes to introduce real quick? I'm Steve Vanderkoy. I'm the Interjurisdictional Fisheries Program Coordinator at the Commission. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, anybody who's on the webinar. Um, we've been working through our CRAB subcommittee for a couple of years now, dealing with terrapin, <clears throat> terrapin issues in the Gulf. Um, we attended two of the work group meetings, the, the regional one in Lafayette a couple of years ago, and we went to the Fairhope meeting, several of us did. Uh, and it just seemed that there was a real breakdown in communication between the terrapin working community and the blue crab working community. Um, I think what we realized was that both groups have a lot to share, a lot of information that could go a long way towards restoration uh, as well as just general protection. Um, so our hope here is that we begin to facilitate those relationships. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion the last part of this meeting with our state representatives. They'll be sitting up here. Um, for the Terrapin people, if there's somebody you just don't know who to contact in a state, these are the people in the agency who are working with the crab fishery. They know the fishermen. They know the way the fishery operates seasonality locations um, and likewise so for the folks who are here presenting to us from the work group um, it's it's our hope that we can actually begin to perhaps start sharing information and uh, and working together we have we have the same common goal so uh, with that I think anybody who has questions uh, following the talks if you would please state your name and affiliation so that we can get it recorded we are recording the webinar. Um, we have one presenter who was not able to be here. Um, it is our hope that he is going to present remotely. I have not gotten in touch with him yet this morning, but I think that he will be on board soon. Otherwise, we'll have a short break. Um, so at any point, if you have questions, jot them down. We provided you a lot of room on the, on the agenda programs to be able to make notes. Uh, feel free to ask the presenters. Um, if there's things that you want to ask your state representatives who will be up here later for the roundtable, um, just let's get the dialogue going. And, oh yes, use this microphone when you come up to ask a question. That way everybody can hear as well as the people on the webinar. Anything else, Joe? Okay. Christine is going to keep you to your time, presenters. If you're getting close to going over, she's going to definitely flag you and let you know. Uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes, I think, between each present for each presentation. 20 minutes for each presentation. So when you get to five minutes, I'll stand up and then um, let you know your time as you get closer. And we'll try and leave a few minutes for questions with each talk. Yep. So try and be around 15 minutes for your talk, and then we'll leave a few minutes for questions. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. So we're going to start off with Rick Burris from the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources, and he's going to be talking about encouraging fisheries cooperation in Mississippi. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> um, good morning. As Christina said, my name is Rick Burris. I'm from the 
Mississippi Department of Marine Resources Office of Marine Fishery, and I'm the Bureau Director for the Shrimp and Crab Bureau. Um, it's kind of dark. Uh, <laughs> today I'm going to go over what the crab fishery and we as fisheries managers are doing for, for terrapin conservation in coastal Mississippi. As fisheries managers, we, we tend to use uh, regulations and statute uh, as the most effective form of management, but we can also be successful uh, through encouraging conservation initiatives and um, cooperating with our stakeholders. So uh, to go over the status of the diamondback terrapin in Mississippi, obviously the species is not listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. However, it is classified by the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks as a non-game species in, in, in need of management, as most reptile species are, with the exception of uh, some of the managed species, American alligator, alligator snapping turtle, bullfrog, some of those. <clears throat> it's then further designated as a species of special concern, along with 36 other reptile species. Um, as far as the, the, the management of diamondback terrapins, uh, they are legal for recreational take uh, from July 1st to March 30th. As long as you have a small game hunting and fishing license and the daily limit uh, recreationally is, is four per person. They cannot be sold commercially, however, captive bred individuals may be sold. And so in Mississippi and the entire Gulf for that matter, um, the major issues that terrapins face are all the same. Habitat loss, especially where we are, is critical. Um, we have a limited coastline with a few small bay systems, and um, <clears throat> we're constantly in, we have constantly increasing coastal development. Um, we got a lot of bulkhead and a lot of filling in of wetlands, um, and we're constantly losing a lot of habitat due to this. The USGS has estimated that in the last past 60 years, we've we've lost about 25% of our of our coastal wetlands, and so all this is a major concern not just for uh, the terrapins, but for our our fishery species as well. So we've been dealing with this um, um, on a on a daily basis. Of course, there are other factors uh, that contribute to terrapin mortality. The main thing, as we all know, is nest predation. Several uh, different species, birds, raccoons, fire ants, and ghost crabs, uh, they all contribute to this, but uh, most, of the, most of the literature points out the primary reason is these raccoons here um, for not only nest predation, but predation to hatchling terrapins as well. And then we got road kills, um, and of course, uh, crab trap seems to be an issue, which is the, the place where we as fisheries managers can actually make a difference. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the methods we use in fisheries management is regulations and statutes. And I won't go over all the regulations we have in the crab fishery, but there's a few of them in, in Mississippi we have that not only benefit the crab fishery, but other, other uh, species in the environment as well. First thing we have is uh, commercial crabbing is restricted to, to designated areas. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we have a few, a few major base systems. We have three major base systems. Um, and those areas are actually, we consider those a nursery ground, so they're off limit to all commercial fish and crabbing included. Recreational crabbing is allowed in those areas, uh, but they're limited to a maximum of six traps per household. All crab traps fished in Mississippi must meet specific requirements to prevent theft and accidental abandonment. And here recently, um, all crab traps fish must have a minimum of two escape rings. And the most important thing, um, most important regulation we have set in place is we have the, the, the availability to close our crab trap season down um, for us to uh, conduct our derelict crab trap rem removals. <clears throat> so to give you an idea of the amount of effort that we have in, the, in Mississippi's crab trap fishery, uh, this goes back to 2002, 2003. Um, but last year we sold 194 commercial crab trap licenses and 809 recreational crab trap licenses. Um, just looking at our trip ticket system, only about half of these commercial licenses are active. Um, but we, we do have a good amount of crab fishermen in the state and we work closely with both the recreational and the commercial side to promote uh, good practices within the fishery. So one of the, uh, in order to collaborate all the goals and ideas from, from uh, from all these fishermen, we initiated the Crab Task Force, the Mississippi Crab Task Force, which consists of representatives from the commercial crab industry, uh, recreational crab fishermen, commercial shrimp fishermen, University of Southern Mississippi Gulf Coast Research Lab fisheries biologists, DMR fisheries managers, as well as enforcement. 
This slide shows the main goals of the task force. It also shows some of the initiatives that the task force uh, has, has generated through these goals. The first goal is to identify problems and issues in the blue crab fishery and possible solutions. And some of the things that this, this, this come out of that, um, they, the cooperation with Gulf Coast Research Lab catch per unit effort projects. This is basically an observer program, and so these fishermen are allowing uh, biologists to go on their boat and record catch data as well as buy catch data as well. Um, and then, of course, the, in, just encouraging user group, user group communication, not only between the recreational and the commercial side, but from, from the crab fishery and other fisheries because everybody's impacted um, with, with what they do, as well as uh, just, just the boating public in general and, and, and environmentalists. Uh, well, the next goal is to encourage conservation of the resource and its habitat. And through this, uh, we've developed the Mississippi Derelict Crab Trap Removal Program, voluntary use of terrapin excluder devices, and uh, the mandatory use of, of escape rings. And um, of course, the overall goal for them is to improve the value of the fishery. And they know that by creating a stable environment, then they're going to ultimately, they should have a sustainable fishery. So they, they, they promote good stewardship within the fishery. And so, as I mentioned, one of the initiatives uh, of the task force is the removal of derelict crab traps. And I, when I say the, the ongoing removal of, uh, of, of derelict crab traps, and derelict crab traps are defined as lost traps, which are typically unbuoyed, unmarked. And the key thing here is that they're not actively fished. Here's a, a shot of a, of a typical derelict crab trap at, at low tide. You can see high tide marks probably up here, but sitting on the bank at, at, a, at a low tide. And they're a problem. Uh, they're a detriment to boaters, whether it's uh, whether they have corks and they've floated off in the uh, navigable waterways, or um, they don't have corks and, and they get spun up in a prop. They're they're a they're a navigational hazard, and they're they're user all the user groups involved they don't like them, in, in, including the fishery. But the main problem with these is that they continue to to ghost fish. Crab, crab traps that aren't actively run um, have the ability to entrap anything, whether they have bait in them or not. <clears throat> this, this, uh, this is a derelict trap that we picked up through, through, through one of our cleanups. You can see that it's full of uh, blue crabs, but it also has stone crabs. There's a hardhead catfish in here. And if you look right here, there's a, there's, there's a marsh hen. So they're not exclusive to just catch crabs. They catch anything that can, that, that can get in there, and, of course, terrapins included in that. And so the more effort that we put into removing these traps from the environment, um, the, the more we're, we're going to work towards creating that stable environment uh, around the fishery. And so this table represents the entire derelict cleanup uh, gulf-wide. As you can see, uh, all the states do an excellent job of, of removing derelict traps year after year. Um, the program goes back to, to, to 1999, and collectively, uh, all Gulf states since the program started have, have removed uh, over 101,000 derelict crab traps from the environment. The Mississippi Derelict Crab Trap Program is a collaboration between the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources, the Gulf Coast Research Lab, the crab task force, commercial crab fishermen, recreational crab fishermen, and, and other volunteers. And as part of the derelict crab trap cleanups, our commercial fishermen alone have removed over 15,000 crab traps. Um, this cleanup effort is a large, large proponent for the, for the protection of not only terrapins, but like I said, all, all species involved. Because actively fish traps that are being run every day or two are not a major issue. Because not only are they being tended to, but most of these traps are found in deeper waters away from the shore. Um, but when you have these derelict traps that are not being run and they're continuing to a ghost fish, most of these traps are typically found inshore, closer to terrapin habitat than these actively fish traps are. And that's where your major problems are occurring. So we can't stress enough how important that, that are these removals are. Just to break down Mississippi's cleanup efforts, we've removed over 21,629. We've removed 21,629 traps from from our coast since it started back in 1999. And as I mentioned, we don't have a very big coast, so this is this is a lot of traps for these guys to go out and uh, and uh, get out of the environment. And we and we think we do a pretty good job at this. <clears throat> um, but uh, 
most of our cleanups, uh, it started out using these large-scale volunteer efforts, and through the success of the program, year after year, we started seeing less and less traps um, brought in. Since Katrina, uh, we've had six volunteer efforts, and the, the, the rest have been strictly staff effort. Um, so with such a small coastline, we're able to actively get out <clears throat> on the water, look for traps, and remove them. So we, we, we've got a pretty good foothold on the uh, removal of these traps that are visual and that are visible in, in our surveys, but we've also been experimenting with different ways, different methods other than the, than the traditional ride the bank at low tide and look for the traps to, to, to try to expand our efforts. And one of the ways that we've done this is, um, one of the methods is the use of side scan surveys for uh, submerged derelict traps. Um, uh, <clears throat> These go unnoticed in our in our routine surveys. Most of these traps are basically all of them. They've they've had their floats cut, so if you and they're in deeper water, so if you're riding around looking for traps in the bank, you're not going to see these. So what we did, we uh, we purchased a Garmin 1200 XS unit. It's got side view imaging, and we're able to go out and run transects. And when we come across a derelict trap, if you look at this, this is a screenshot of our of our uh, of our unit actually in in the field working. You can see this clearly defined trap. There was no buoy attached to this, but that's a crab trap, and you can definitely see it. And when we when we see those, we mark them, and we got a, we got them marked in our, in our in our GPS. We have the coordinates, and we're able to go back to those spots. And uh, what we do is we throw out a buoy. Here's a here's here's our homemade buoy here. We throw it out on the trap on on the uh, coordinates that that we originally marked, and then we can throw out a uh, throw out a grappling hook somewhere around the buoy and it, it, it may take a few tries, but eventually we, uh, we end up hooking the trap. Once we hook the trap, we then bring it in the boat and uh, the trap's out of the water. Uh, we, we've had some pretty good success doing this, using this method. Um, it, we've, we're still kind of new at it. Um, I think this year so far, we've removed about 49 traps doing this, um, but we're gonna continue to, to, to run these transects. Um, it's, we we concentrate all our effort in 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 areas in the bays um, where our shrimp trawl fishery can't access because they they typically handle all the all the dare, all the submerged traps that are out in trawlable water. So we're going to continue doing this and hopefully get a little bit better at it. And um, we can we can uh, transect new new areas and um, hopefully locate some possible hot spots where these traps just may um, may. Uh, accumulate more than other areas another effort that is basically in its in its infancy is the aerial use um, is the aerial surveys uh, to remove derelict traps um, like I said the traditional method is to ride the bank look on the side look on the sides of the bayou during during low tides but uh, not only do you miss those submerged traps you're also missing the traps that may have been pushed back into the marsh um, because you, you you really don't get a good visual uh, out out in the grass when you're when you're riding in a boat, and so uh, we're we're working with experimenting with a drone to see if we can get the drone up and uh, locate these traps that that otherwise we we uh, may not see. We've started experimenting, looking at different elevations. We've looked at 60 foot, um, 90 foot, and 120 foot. Obviously, the higher you get, the more you're going, the more area you're, you're going to cover. But the resolution may not may not be as good. This uh, shot is at 120 foot. I mean, we actually placed out a couple of derelict crab traps, just to, or a couple of a couple of our crab traps, just to see what we could see. Um, you see our you see our vessel here parked at the mouth of this little bay, um, and those traps are hidden up there. If you want to, does anybody see them? Can y'all? You know, point them out. All right. Well, I'll give you a little bit of help. So, here's a trap right here that's that's in the water. You can you can see it pretty well. There's also another little yellow trap down here that's that's that's, that's in the marsh. If you zoom in on it, um, here's a trap that's on the point. Now, if, if if we were just riding around on our on our routine surveys and we could we could pick that trap up, but if that trap was up in one of these shallow bays or up in one of these little tiny bayous and we wouldn't be able to access that with a boat. We probably wouldn't see it. But by using this method, we can we can locate these traps and mark them with with GPS coordinates and figure out a way to get back to them, whether that be a kayak or waders or whatever. We're, but we're trying to find traps that boats can't can't access. 
The same with this area, with this uh, trap down here. It's it's up in it's up in the marsh grass. If the if, if if the grass is too high and we can't see it, um, we can now see it with these surveys, with these uh, aerial surveys. And once again, this marks the uh, marks the coordinates, and we can we can go right back to it. So as I mentioned, uh, the other objective of the task force is uh, the implementation of the Mississippi Crab Trap Bird and Ted program. Through this, we, we, we distribute the standard two by six inch terrapin, terrapin excluder devices. And this, this project's been ongoing for a while. We've distributed over 19,000 TEDs. Um, and we also, the past year, we've been distributing two and three eighths inch escape rings uh, to both commercial and recreational crab fishermen. And we've given out 55,000 uh, birds as escape rings as of uh, yesterday. But we're trying to get new ways and, and, and inventive ways to, to, to get these fishermen to volunteer to use TEDs. And uh, one of the ways we've doing, we, we began doing that two years ago um, is by distributing or dis distributing TEDs to crab fishermen when they come to purchase their license. So in order to buy a crab trap in, in, in Mississippi, you have to come to, to our office. So anybody that comes in to buy, to buy a license, a crab trap license, we offer them. We see if they want to volunteer to use TEDs. And it's been pretty successful. Um, so far, the past two years, we, we've given out uh, 5,876 TEDs. And when we, when we, uh, when these fishermen volunteer to use these TEDs, they uh, we, uh, give, we give them the sheet and it, it, they explain uh, the benefits of using TEDs and it tells them how to uh, in, install those in their in their traps and it has some contact information here. Um, but they, we we've had some success with that. The fishermen are eager to use these. Not only do they do they keep out uh, terrapins, but they also keep out otters. So so the fishermen really like these like these TEDs. Um. Another project that we have, uh, it's it it won't even start until until next week. Is we've developed a pilot diamondback terrapin reporting system, and it's it's a phone based app. It's powered by Arc, Arc GIS, and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, send some commercial crab fishermen out out in the field to uh, to test this to test this app out, and it's very simple to use. Uh, they in, they insert their license number. It, it generates their name from our from our license database. They then tell us how many traps they ran that day, uh, how long those traps soaked, the start and stop time from when they ran those traps, and then if they observed any terrapins while they're while they're running their traps. And it's a uh, the the app actually enables the GPS within the phone, and they can mark um, the spots on a map where they saw those terrapins. So. Um, we think this will this will give us a pretty good data set uh, of of uh, once these fishermen get out in the field, it's going to give us a pretty good data set on um, where these localized populations of terrapins are, at least within the commercial crab fishing areas. Um, and if we're, we're going to try to do this for about 12 months or maybe more, um, and if and if we get some good information, which I think we will, um, then it's something we can share with the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group and possibly even. Um, get some of our recreational guys to use it as well, and maybe even pass it along to uh, other states. So, um, these are just a few of the things Mississippi is doing. Um, we have a, a great group of fishermen that contribute a lot of time and a lot of effort in the conservation programs that we have, and we wanted to give them all the credit uh, that's that's due to them. So, that's all I have. Is any questions? Now, um, Tracy Castellon with Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, I'm very impressed with your cleanup efforts. I commend you for it. Thank you. Um, I have a question about: um, Are you collecting data on the bycatch when you do your cleanups? And if you are, could you give us a sense of the scale of, of diamondback terrapin captures in the ghost traps that you're cleaning up? We do collect bycatch data, and just off the top of my head. It's very minimal. Um, there are some instances where, where, where there have been terrapins in the, in, in, in the traps, but from it, it's very, very minimal. Yeah. Any other 
questions? So our next speaker is Stephen Pearson from the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, and he is our remote presentation this morning. So we are ready to go on that. Steve, are you there? Steve, you're going to have to, uh, if you have a computer with a microphone, Turn on your microphone and see if that works. Otherwise, you have to phone in. Switch the audio to your computer, or you have to phone in and use the pin. And I just hope you can hear me. <laughs> Technology. Okay, hello, uh, folks in Mobile, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We got you on now. And you're going to go ahead and take controls, or do you want us to? You've got controls, so if you want to go ahead and start your presentation, we can see your screen. There we go. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you for having me today. I apologize for not being there in person, and I greatly appreciate uh, the commission's ability to, to have me here through the webinar. So thank you very much. So today I'm going to present to you some of the work we've done here in Louisiana looking at, at diamondback terrapin nesting ecology throughout uh, coastal Louisiana. We'll mostly focus on the delta deltaic plain of Louisiana and just some uh, brief notes on the chenier plains, which are uh, further to the west. And I'll show you that in a moment. Before I get started, just wanted to thank uh, the, our collaborators and funding sources uh, for this work, uh, especially my um, co, uh, you know, uh, principal investigator, John Weed, um, uh, with this program. Without him, uh, we wouldn't have uh, made it nearly this far. Uh, the Office of Fisheries has provided a number uh, a, a great amount of funding to participate in this work. Uh, Dr. Will Selman, uh, who is now at Millsaps College, he has uh, been a great collaborator in this as well. And of course, without the help of all the coastal property owners, uh, we would not have been able to access many of these sites to complete this work. So Diamondback Terrapin uh, in Louisiana have been um, understudied over, over the over the last few decades. Within since 2011, that has started to change. As you can see on this table, Louisiana has uh, a large amount of potential diamondback terrapin habitat, uh, with the, the outer coastline being 639 uh, kilometers in length, but the tidal shoreline being greater than 12,000 uh, kilometers, which 
uh, as you compare with the other Gulf states, is is the most amount of potential tidal shoreline. And then in terms of marsh area, with over 600,000 uh, hectares, it's it's the potential habitat for diamondback terrapins in Louisiana um, is is amongst the it is the greatest across the full range between uh, between Massachusetts and Texas. So in this figure, you can see all the, all that potential habitat uh, within Louisiana. The uh, as you move north on that map, you get fresher and fresher, and further south in those uh, dark reds and uh, peach or tan color. Is, is, that's more of the potential diamondback terrapin habitat. And you can see that here in, in this figure where the red is all the saline marsh and the lighter, uh, the lighter color would be the um, intermediate and brackish marsh. And noticeable here is of course the Mississippi River in which case that's a uh, high influx of fresh water and uh, is a potential uh, barrier to movement between, uh, between regions. Across the Terrapin Range, uh, different research groups have, um, have been working with Diamondback Terrapins uh, within all these different areas over time. There are uh, a large amount of work that's come through the Mid-Atlantic, the Chesapeake Bay, the Carolinas, uh, across uh, the peninsula of Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and, and Florida on the Gulf Coast, and Texas. And this is what we were saying prior to the work that uh, Dr. Selman and our group have been working on, uh, very little have been done in, in Louisiana. So prior to 2010, there were only 34 uh, validated specimens across the coast, with um, many of them being in the Baltic region, which is circled uh, in red there, and 12 uh, within the Chenier Plain circled in blue. So we've been working to close this gap uh, by taking a few different uh, tactics. Uh, and those include looking at populations. Uh, Dr. Selman has worked across the Chenier Plain, and uh, we have worked through the deltaic, deltaic region. In addition to that, we've done some genetic connectivity work and, and found very little uh, differentiation across the coast. And uh, of interest to this group are interactions with the blue crab fishery. I'll touch just a little bit on <coughs> excuse me, some of the work we, we did with that at the end of this presentation, but uh, Dr. Lively will, will talk more about the interactions in Louisiana uh, in the next presentation. So our work in Louisiana, uh, we've worked to look at, look at the distribution and abundance of terrapins across Louisiana uh, to hone in on, on individual populations uh, when possible and our, and our recapture numbers have been high enough. And uh, to document the terrapin nesting ecology and reproductive uh, productivity across coastal Louisiana. So that's the focus of today's talk, and um, I'll get right to it. So in order to complete this work, we set up access agreements with all of these private coastal landowners and land managers uh, on public property uh, throughout the state. So it's an extensive amount of work to complete this, and, and we really appreciate their help. The methods that we've used to, uh, to identify potential terrapin habitat were based on, uh, on where we know we have found terrapins throughout coastal Louisiana uh, in our abundance and distribution study. So we had an idea where they may be. And then uh, match that up with the habitat suitability from the literature and uh, professional communication with other researchers across the range. The nest characteristics that we uh, looked for when we visited different beaches were signs of 
predators. If we found nests either intact or depredated, the clutch dive for uh, intact eggs, we looked at egg morphometrics, and we took we tried to determine uh, habitat characteristics of nesting areas uh, through looking at the surface characteristics of, of either nest. And these figures on the right just show the 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 figure up top the variability uh in a nesting site those the the site you see there is a small potential nesting site that uh, if we saw we would pull the boat up to and check to see the of uh, the nesting habitat across louisiana appears to be fairly limited so we we think that terrapins would use a very small nesting area like that uh, if if they were uh, nearby. And the bottom uh, just shows an intact nest that we found uh, after it has been uh, excavated. Our results from these terrapin uh, nest searches are shown here. And what we can see here are the different uh, management basins that are labeled across the bottom, starting in the east, we have the Pontchartrain Basin uh, to the west of the Mississippi River, the Barataria Basin. Moving further west, Terrebonne Basin, uh, the Vermilion Basin, which has a major output of the Atchafalaya River, uh, so a lot of fresh water coming into that basin, and then uh, across the southwest. The nests that we found and many of the nesting sites that we found are distributed on the outer fringes of the marsh and within the interior marsh a very limited amount of habitat and on the table on the left you can see the summary of the number of nests that we found we have looked at these data in terms of management basins uh, because that's how the uh, crab fishery and other fisheries in Louisiana are, are managed within these individual basins. So we uh, hope that our, our, our work can be used to target particular management within those basins if, if necessary. Uh, the open circles are intact nests and the X's are depredated nests. And you can see in most areas uh, within Terrebonne, Barataria, and Pontchartrain, and Vermilion, where we've looked, we found uh, uh, we found intact nests, and that's mostly uh, an effort-based uh, finding. If we were to search more uh, effort within the southwestern region, I'm certain we would find intact nests as well. In terms of, of predation, we had ranges uh, from 70, 68 to 88 uh, percent predation with, uh, across the state. And at a particular site that we studied in greater detail in 2015 uh, was a lower percent, 47 percent. And all of these ranges uh, fall within the, the published uh, ranges from other studies across the species range. Um, as was found in Mississippi and presented before, we have many of the same uh, nest predators, ghost crabs, raccoons, um, coyotes on, uh, on some of the larger uh, islands and marsh areas, otters and uh, ants as well. In terms of clutch size, there appear to be some differences depending on the basin. Uh, so in Pontchartrain Basin, uh, further to the west, uh, further to the east, sorry, the clutch size averaged 5.9 uh, in intact nests. And when you combine both intact and depredated nests, uh, it was 4.8. But uh, we think the depredated nest numbers are underrepresented uh, based on loss of, sh of shells or, or scavenging at, at the surface. So for, for our 
our analyses and, and utilizing these data in different management, we like to stick with the intact mass uh, numbers. And so you can see it ranges from 5.9 in Pontchartrain to uh, 7.2 eggs per nest in Barataria Basin. And the photos at the bottom uh, just it, are those indicating uh, what an intact nest looks like on, the, um, on your right and what a depredated nest would look like on, on your left. Oftentimes, those are, are simply desiccated shells uh, that we find at the surface. In terms of egg morphometrics, uh, the Pontchartrain Basin had the largest eggs at 37.2 uh, average length, and Terrebonne Bay had the smallest eggs at 36.3. Um, and that is true for both width and uh, likely holds true for mass. Uh, we, we didn't successfully measure mass in Pontchartrain Basin in 2014, uh, uh, during one of our sampling years when we worked there um, most extensively. So we don't have uh, data from mass from Pontchartrain Basin, but this would correlate fairly well with, uh, with our uh, population work where we found that Pontchartrain Basin has some of the, uh, has the largest females uh, across Louisiana with uh, smaller females in Barataria and still smaller in Terrebonne. Our vegetative, our surface characteristics. Uh, most of our nests, so 60% of them, were found without vegetation on uh, on the surface, and an additional 25% of nests have less than 50% vegetative cover. So the, the majority of nests are being are being laid in open uh, open areas. We looked at nest slope and uh, micro topography of each of each nest uh, to see if exposure potentially might uh, if if the terrapins might be selecting for different exposures on the beach. And we did find that 25% of nests were laid on north facing uh, slopes, while 12.5% were on south facing slopes and equally distributed uh, six and a quarter between east and west facing slopes. So if terrapins are selecting for these north facing slopes, it may, it may impact the, the, te the nest temperature, which could impact the uh, sex determination of the hatchling terrapins. In terms of our uh, other characteristics of, of the nest, we have the average depth to the nest of the top and then uh, depth to the floor of the nest. And you can see that it varies by, uh, by substrate type. So the vast majority of, of Louisiana shoreline uh, and nesting areas are, consist of shell hash. Uh, rather than sand across much of the range, terrapins will nest in sand uh, or or finer sediments. But uh, in Louisiana, much of the coast line is shell hash, and so we found deeper nests within shell hash than within uh, sand. The generally the only basin that we found um, sand nests were within Barataria in. Terrebonne Basin, on some of the barrier islands, there are sand, uh, sand beaches. However, we uh, found very few nesting uh, terrapin nests on those islands. They're fairly uh, disjunct from the uh, interior marsh. And as the coast erodes, that, that distance gets greater. In 2015, we, in 2014, we found a nesting site that had a very high density of nest, uh, of terrapin nests. So we returned to that nest uh, site fairly exclusively in 2015 to try to refine some of the 
uh, parameters that we've discussed before. So we looked at nest characteristics, egg morphometrics, uh, predation, survivorship, and hatching success. And for some of that, we uh, were able to cage some nests and leave particular nests uh, natural. And of those nests, uh, eight of our cage nests were uh, uh, predated by coyotes, and uh, four of our natural nests were um, predated as well. So we had 14 of our 20 uh, study nests that remained. Within those, there were 109 eggs, of which 82 hatched. So that's 75% hatching success uh, on this particular beach. And uh, likely that type of success, that falls within the range that we found across uh, the state as well. The success within individual clutches uh, range from 36% to 100% uh, success. And the photo in the top just shows some of our biologists uh, building one of these nests and protecting a nest. And on the back, on the bottom right or left, you'll have uh, just one of the hatchlings that we've found here in Louisiana. The hatchling size uh, for those opportunistically collected hatchlings, uh, we looked at their, at, at their average size um, ac across this particular beach. And we found that all of our size, sizes uh, essentially fall within uh, the published range of terrapins. So this finding, uh, coupled with the, the finding on the clutch size, uh, discussed above about seven, uh, at the max, uh, a little bit over seven eggs per clutch, we found, we, we've found that uh, clutch sizes in Louisiana are smaller than those in on the Atlantic uh, coast and uh, are in range, but can be smaller in certain basins than uh, clutch sizes across uh, the Gulf Coast. Without an increase in without an increase in hatchling size, so there's the uh, terrapins in Louisiana at least are not compensating. Uh, with a for a smaller clutch size with increased size of hatchlings. Our statewide surveys have increased the understanding of diamondback terrapin uh, nesting ecology uh, across Louisiana. And with continued research, uh, we'd be able to further improve our understanding of terrapin nesting ecology and population status. These data are important in terms of management uh, for m marine fisheries uh, and potential interactions with, with fisheries such as the crab fishery. And the life history information can be used to model injuries uh, from increased mortality due to uh, different uh, sources of mortality such as oil and gas spills, and fishery and fishery interactions. We have used uh, the data already in a resource equivalency analysis uh, to look at, at the potential impacts from uh, from increased mortality on on diamondback terrapins and how uh, it can help us uh, inform the restoration activities across Louisiana's coast. Louisiana's coast is uh, there's um, a large amount of restoration activity going on. Much of it is based on uh, creating marsh. And we would like to see uh, these data utilized to uh, better inform the, the edge characteristics of those beaches, uh, of those um, restoration platforms to benefit terrapins and, and other wildlife uh, species. The, so that, that same work uh, can be used with CRIPA projects C, uh, within the CPR master plan, CPRA master plan and Deepwater Horizon restoration. Those are all activities that are uh, moving forward 
and will be intensifying over the next 15 and 20 years. We'd like to further refine the nesting period duration and peaks, as well as the nest pr uh, predator communities, and to uh, better understand the fate of Dimebacter and Pinnest and uh, Hatchling. Uh, ongoing work include mark recapture, the population structure work uh, within each individual basin and how that can inform the um, CRAD task force uh, in, in planning across Louisiana. The, I just wanted to mention real quickly uh, some of the work we did with uh, bycatch and derelict crab traps. In 2014, Louisiana had a, um, a crab fishery closure within the Terrebonne Basin, which uh, corresponded well with one of our, uh, some of our study sites. And we uh, systematically sampled uh, much of the beach or much of, of the area. And we found, um, you know, many of the same species that they had found in, uh, in Mississippi. Blue crabs were the largest uh, bycatch. Second to that were sheep's head. We had stone crabs and bandwagon terrapins in derelict traps were our fourth largest bycatch species. Um, and here you can just see the uh, distribution. Blue crabs were, were evenly distributed. Uh, sheep's head were in uh, fresher areas. Uh, stone crab were biased towards the higher salinity areas and diamondback terrapins as well uh, within the higher salinity areas. And Dr. Lively will talk uh, more about interactions with the crab fisheries uh, coming up next. And so just our parting thoughts are that habitat loss um, is a major component here in, the, in Louisiana and in other parts of the Terrapin Range. And that the, the anthropogenic activities uh, can cause impacts to, to terrapins and, and other uh, species within uh, Louisiana and, the, and throughout the range. So this work could not have been done without all of the uh, field personnel that have helped with this over, over, the, over the years, uh, fisheries and wildlife and fisheries and volunteers uh, who have been quite helpful. And with that, if I have time, I'll take questions. So Steve, we don't have any time for questions, but I want to thank you for um, participating in the session remotely. It worked out really well for us to be able to have your presentation, and I'm sorry you weren't able to be here in person, but I'm glad you were able to present for us. All right, thank you. I look forward to listening to the rest of uh, the day's meeting. <laughs> Fantastic. Our next speaker is going to be Julia Lively from Louisiana State University Ag Center and Louisiana Sea Grant. And she's going to be speaking on bycatch in the commercial blue crab fishery in Louisiana. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I was asked today too, so I'm research extension faculty with Renewable Natural Resources at LSU and with Louisiana Sea Grant. And over the last uh, almost eight years, we've done a variety of crab research in my lab. And through that, I tried to kind of come up with wherever we've been able to really document and get solid numbers on the bycatch that we've seen specifically, obviously since the focus today, focusing on terrapins. <laughs> so uh, there's four main studies that I'm trying to pull some of the data from today. Um, the first two are both derelicts. The first one that he mentioned, Anderson and Elford. I was Anderson, now I'm Lively for anyone that's confused. Um, we were able to document in the removals and cleanups, um, as Jeff mentioned earlier. Uh, and then the derelict um, gear that we did some simulated derelict fishing gear. Um, and then two studies where we actually were doing active baiting um, and actually a bait testing project that we were working on. But my students also documented any bycatch and discards that they had along the way. 
And throughout this work, we also have done a lot of writings of ride-alongs, things like that. And I want to say that anything that we've seen really mimics what we've seen on the boats with the commercial fishermen. Um, unfortunately, when I get to the end of some of the kind of conclusions, further steps, a lot of the bycatch when we've done the actual ride-alongs with commercial aren't documented well enough that we could really give rates to. It's more kind of anecdotal. Um, and I think that's something that we need to work on as a whole in the research community. So um, as we talked as uh, we talked about earlier um, with the cleanups, Louisiana has also been doing the cleanups. Um, in 2011, we had seen in Louisiana there had been a really a decline in volunteer participation, um, really dropping off. And so Louisiana Sea Grant was able to get a grant from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to create the Derelict Crab Trap Rodeo because everyone loves a fishing rodeo, so we figured we could go fishing for crab traps. With this, we had two main objectives. The first was obviously just to get derelict traps and any other gear that we happened to encounter um, out of the water. But then the second was also to try and actually quantify the ghost fishing that was actually occurring because we know it's happening, but there were no numbers from Louisiana really for the ghost fishing rates. So uh, in 2012, we did it out of the Delacro area and Hopedale, which are up at Delacro and Cocodry. And then in 2013, it was Hopedale and Point of La Hache, which is all up in this area of the state. Um, and as Rick talked about earlier, that it is you know, grappling hooks off the boats. It's at low tides in February or March, so for the most part, it's going after the traps that we can see. So with this, you know, the first focus was to get as much wire out of the water as possible, um, as well as a couple nets, a couple inflatable Christmas decorations were the favorite catches. Um, but we were able to document along the way, but not every trap was documented for ghost fishing. But at each of these locations, you can see just the percent of traps that were documented that were ghost fishing, which ranged anywhere from 33 to 88 um, percent. So this isn't the total number of traps, but of the ones that were actually documented. Um, but you can see it in some areas where they just have been thrown up along the shore. These are probably ones that the shrimpers encountered and tried to throw up knowing that they were derelict. Uh, so there's a lot, just if you are really interested in the other species, I wanted to list them. This is all of the bycatch we got. Um, this is what was published in Anderson and Elford. But blue crab, uh, so at Delacro, we had 724 traps that were actually documented. We had 325 blue crabs and two terrapin. Cocodry, we had 44 traps that were documented. We had 13 blue crab and 13 terrapin, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, Point of Lahash, 149 traps. Um, almost that many blue crabs, no terrapins were seen. Hopedale, again, we saw 156 traps were actually documented. Almost 400 blue crabs and 14 terrapins. And again, the Cocodry and Hopedale sites are what I get the most phone calls about. Um, so Delacro, 37% of the traps were actually documented for ghost fishing, which we thought was pretty good, and we saw two terrapins in that range. Uh, Point of La Hash, we had about 30% and zero terrapins. Cocodry and Hopedale, we know there was bias sampling. Traps were brought in. This was part of when uh, LWF Wildlife was trying to actually get terrapins for some of their studies. And we had a handful of traps that were brought in that those boats didn't document anything else on any of the other traps, but they specifically found traps with terrapins, so they brought the terrapins back. When it came to publishing, that was kind of a heartache for us. Of We definitely wanted to document that terrapins had been caught, but we also knew that it was really bias sampling. Um, at Cocodry, three of those traps were only brought in because they had terrapin shell, and they were documented for that reason. Um, but we didn't get any other numbers on any of the other, you know, 100 traps that were brought in by that team. But something that we noticed and something that we often see that there were actually only four traps that actually had terrapins. Um, one trap had three, one had four, one actually had five shells in it, and one had a single shell. Um, and all of these, I believe, at Cocodry were just the shells that were left. Um, there was no other animal tissue left. At Hopedale, we did have a few terrapins that were relatively freshly dead, um, but again, mostly shells, and again, they were mostly grouped. I don't have the specific numbers on how they were grouped. So one of the other projects we wanted to work on was kind of the simulated gear. So again, knowing, you know, with the Derelict crab trap rodeos, one of the big problems is we have no idea how long that wire was out there. Uh, we tried doing some, you know, one of our goals with that study was to kind of document how intact the traps were, try and get some like aging. 
and nothing we did with that study, we weren't able to really get any idea of how long any of that gear had been out there. So at four locations across Louisiana, um, again, Delacroix, Grand Isle, um, Cocodri or Lumcon, and Rockefeller, uh, we set 10 traps out for a year. We baited them for the first five days and checked them, and then checked them monthly after that. Uh, crabs were marked and put back in uh, so we could document how long the crabs actually stayed or if they were able to escape, get back into other traps. Um, due to avoiding Iacook issues, we did not mark and recapture any of the other animals, um, only the invertebrates. But we did look at average monthly mortality and tried to standardize everything by traps, soak days, um, and due to us apparently violating LSU accounting by high, trying to hire a fisherman, we had to eliminate Delacroix after four months, unfortunately. Um, but for the other sites, we had almost a full year. Uh, Cocodri also in the last month, uh, last two, three months, we had actually students from my department go out, see empty crab traps and thought, hey, we can catch dinner. So they baited them um, and caught and didn't, <laughs> And after the fact, you notice know, they're like, oh yeah, a lot of the crabs had markings on them in those traps. That was weird. Uh, but, so we also had to eliminate cocodri, not quite the full year. Um, but at that point, they really hadn't been catching hardly anything those last couple months. Um, whereas Grand Isle, and especially Rockefeller, continued to actively catch for the entire year. Um, and Rockefeller was actually seen an upswing in blue crab catch when we stopped the study at a year. Um, but you can see just total crab. Um, Rockefeller is the wildlife management area. Commercial traps aren't allowed, um, or trapping in general. And we definitely saw the most crab there. And just to show things were definitely remaining in the traps, that's also one of the questions we often get. Uh, you know, were we definitely seeing things even at that month? Um, we had, this was my favorite crab. We marked it four times. Um, and that fifth month, it was finally gone. Uh, it lived and survived in the trap for somewhere between four and five months. And we had plenty of crabs that survived multiple months in the trap. Um, and we were definitely seeing the remains of fish and other animals in these traps. So this is all the bycatch. And in this study, we actually never caught or encountered a single terrapin uh, in the traps. However, we did see the terrapins in the water nearby. Um, but we never had one in any of our ghost fishing traps. So moving to some of our baited trap research, because uh, we also know that Besides following other terrapins in, the terrapins may also be going after the same bait that the blue crabs like. Um, one of my students, uh, Nikki Anderson, did some bait testing. Uh, it was three trips between October and November of 2013, where at Grand Isle and Cocodree, she put out 20 paired traps um, and did everything for, uh, for all of our baited work. Everything here has been at two days soak, uh, 48 hours. Um, and everything was done to mimic exactly how the commercial fishermen, um, all the traps were bought directly from a crap, trap company. And again, hardhead uh, pinfish were definitely some sheep's head, definitely the largest bycatch she saw. Um, hardhead catfish is usually one of the largest bycatch that we always see in the traps. Um, but we never encountered any terrapins uh, in either the Grand Isle or the Cocodree site. And if you recall, Cocodri is that one that did have as many blue crabs as terrapins in the, uh, from the rodeo data, data. And yeah, this is before I actually bought them a real boat. <laughs> the students after were excited when they got a better boat. Um, Beth Klaus also did a full year-long study looking at testing bait um, in many of the same marshes. She went out at Rockefeller, Cocodri, and Grand Isle. Um, and she did seasonally. So that way we were able to catch summer, fall, spring, and winter. Uh, and she did 30 traps each season at each of the sites. Again, a two-day soak to kind of mimic. We at least were trying to stay, even though we know the fishermen will alter their soak times in the winter, um, usually having a longer soak time. We also were trying to standardize it a little bit for the bait work. Um, and four traps were lost along the way. But she ended up with a total of 356 traps basically in the water for 48 hours. And she landed 800, almost 850 total crabs. In terms of bycatch, hardhead catfish was again the number one bycatch. Um, but she also saw these diamondback terrapins. And she had two of them. They were both in the spring at Grand Isle. Um, and both of them were dead in the trap. Um, and I believe they were both actually, there were two in one trap. Um, again, where it looked like one may have followed the other one in. 
So across the state, you know, and one of the questions I also also get is, are these areas that we definitely see terrapins? Um, so this is the map from the genetic research um, that Dr. Pearson just mentioned with Petra et al. in 2015. Um, these are also the same areas that Selman et al. did for the 2014 published study. Um, so all of the dots are their existing genetic study where they took terrapins. Um, and these are all of the sites where my lab has done some sort of trapping studies um, and we've been able to actually document, and we've often seen terrapins in the water, but what we've actually seen and encountered in the crab traps. So to kind of summarize everything, um, we basically have the four points where we've actually seen the terrapins in the traps. Um, Delacroix in the, you know, rodeo traps that have been out there for an indefinite amount of time. Um, when you average it of just terrapin per trap, we can't do terrapin per trap by time because we don't have time. Um, it was 0.002 um, and baited at Grand Isle where we can at least do, you know, it was over the season, they were only seen in the spring, but you look at 0.008 terrapins per trap per day. Um, again, Hopedale and Kokadri, we definitely have seen some interactions, but I think these numbers are definitely inflated because of that bias sampling because traps were only brought in for that reason. Um, so I think those, those rates would be a little bit high, but we definitely have seen some interactions there. Uh, however, we've also run over 11,000 plus soak days of traps in the water. Um, and soak day would just be a trap being out there actively fishing that we have not encountered any terrapins. Um, so it seems like this is definitely matching up with what we're seeing from the commercial fishermen, that this is what we hear a lot from them, that they do see a few, and if they see if they do see the terrapins, they're seeing a couple of them in a trap, and they'll see it for a short time period um, in very localized area. Um, and that it's definitely seasonal. Um, so again, most of ours were caught in the spring um, months, uh, where again, I'm not a terrapin biologist, but I've been told that's often when you know a male baby following a female into the trap. Um, and this is definitely what we've been seeing with the fishermen. Uh, However, I think we also as a whole need to do a lot more documentation of bycatch and discards in the fisheries. Um, I'm also working on a ghost fishing review right now. And as a whole, as scientists, we don't publish zeros. And so even trying to find some of the other published work on terrapins and with bycatch, if they are seen, it's definitely emphasized. But if things aren't seen, and even some other endangered species as we've been trying to do this review around the world, if it's not seen, it's just never mentioned. Um, and so with all of this other work, we've never really mentioned it because we just don't see them. Um, so I think that's something that we need to do a better job of so we can really document and get a better idea of what are the rates. So for management, if we have better rates of what is the likelihood by season and by area, then management uh, can do a lot more with that information. Um, I'd like to acknowledge this funding came from Sea Grant, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, and then a whole lot of lab help um, research associates, grad students, uh, and student uh, researchers. Um, and with that, I think I have quite a bit of time for questions. Time for questions. Anyone has a question? Um, again, please use the time up now. All right, thank you very much. So our next speaker is Willem Rosenberg, and he's going to be speaking on um, terrapin and blue crabs on the Atlantic coast, which is where historically a lot of the research work has been done with terrapin and blue crab interactions. I think it'll give a different perspective um, than what we've been talking about. So great. Thank you, Christina. Um, and I'd like to thank the Gulf States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission for inviting me down and giving a talk on something that um, I think is a really important issue. Um, so to start, I want to talk about the problem with turtles in general. Um, turtles are an organism that have delayed maturity. Um, this is a rather extreme case illustrating snapping turtles from um, Ontario, which don't mature until they're um, 17 years of age. But as a consequence, when we look at other species that are frequently managed in 
either fisheries or in um, wildlife management, their rates of population growth are uh, relatively slow. So this puts them in the same category as things like whales and maybe even sharks um, with terms with regard to their population growth rates. So here's um, some actual, um, maybe a comparison that's more relative for this group. Um, this is using an exponential growth model, starting with a thousand terrapins and using published literature for um, two very important commercial fisheries species in Chesapeake Bay, blue crabs and striped bass, and then also adding terrapins. And what we see is that while blue crabs and striped bass have relatively rapid growth rates, um, terrapin populations have really slow growth rates, right? And this is based on a population where um, we have high predation rates. And contributing to this is the fact that these animals are long-lived. Terrapins live to be in excess of 40 years old. Um, they have delayed maturity, not as bad as snapping turtles in Ontario, but as late as eight years. And um, here in the south, southern region, um, their maturity is around six years of age. They have very low reproductive output. This model is based on 40 offspring, 40 eggs produced per year. Um, and as Steve just showed us, um, the reproductive output of terrapins in southern populations is much lower. So um, these guys have low juvenile survivorship and high adult survivorship. And one of the things that I hope to convince you of is that a major contributing factor to this low juvenile survivorship is the fact that um, crab pots play an important role um, in, in affecting that, right? And also that there are simple cost-effective ways in which we can prevent this mortality from happening. Now, I'd like to describe um, the impact of crab pots at two different levels. The first one is what I refer to as a daily catch rate in crabs that are actively fished. So this is a waterman going out every day, checking his crab pots, um, and he catches a turtle and he throws it back overboard. Um, and I hope to demonstrate that this has high impact on terrapin populations that accumulates um, uh, slowly. The other type is that in ghost pots or derelict pots, um, and these have an unknown impact, um, but they do have a really dramatic perception, primarily because sometimes these pots come up with literally hundreds of dead turtles in them um, at one time. All right, so uh, one of the techniques that we use to estimate our catch rates um, on a daily basis in crab pots is using um, these tall crab pots that uh, my students and I actually built um, and use them as a tool to try and understand um, these background uh, rates, All right? And um, these are my studies right here that we have done um, and these are um, different published catch rates of turtles um, out of a CPU catch, turtle catch per day. Um, and they range from the very, very low, as we've seen from some of the studies, from um, you know, 0 0.003 um, to um, as high as one, one, more than one turtle per day in a crab pot. Um, suffice it to say there, within this range, I think a fair estimate of what is happening in a terrapin population where they're um, is a healthy terrapin population is that it's somewhere around, oops, sorry, um, point, uh, around 0 0.2 terrapins per day or um, the first estimate that we have from our population, 0.17 um, uh, as a, an actual um, terrapin catch rate in a healthy population. So um, I worked in a part of Chesapeake Bay where uh, commercial crab potting is actually not allowed, but recreational crab potting is. And so uh, what I did was calculated based on um, 80 terrapins that were caught in a total 470 crab pot days. Um, that's where that uh, 1.17 uh, terps per day estimate came from. And then to estimate the fishing effort in my area, uh, Maryland allows recreational crabbers to have two crab pots from their peers. Virtually every pier has two crab pots and many piers have way more than two crab pots. Um, but as a rough estimate, um, we looked at 69 piers that were in this study area. 
where I was working 92 days, which is essentially the day, the months of June, July, and August. Um, so this is the total fishing effort. And then um, this is the annual catch rate of about 2,000 terrapins in my study population per year. Right? This is the population estimate for the terrapins in that population that I was working with. This was a declining population. And um, based on this terrapin estimate and using um, this catch rate, if we assume that there is 100% mortality in crab pots, then we're looking at 58 to 78% of the population being removed on an annual basis. Whereas if we assume a 25% crab pot mortality rate, we're looking at 15 to 19% of the population being re removed annually. So these are really high population removal rates, especially when we're talking about an organism that has a population growth rate that is very, very um, low. So um, the next thing I want to do is uh, illustrate to you that um, the terrapins, that there's a uh, bias with regard to the size of terrapins that get caught in crab pots. The funnel essentially restricts um, larger individuals. And in Chesapeake Bay, where I work, we have a very dramatic sexual size dimorphism. So this is an adult female on the bottom, an adult male on the top. Um, and as a consequence, these are turtles caught in crab pots and their plastron lengths. What we see is that males remain vulnerable throughout their entire life um, because they never get big enough to outgrow the size of the funnels. Whereas females, when they get um, uh, older and larger, are uh, no longer vulnerable to getting caught in crab pots. And one of the consequences of this is if we look at many populations where there are heavy crab pot fisheries, there are strongly female biased sex ratios. I'm currently work working in a population where there's a substantial commercial fishery and the sex ratio bias is nine to one females to males. Okay, so um, you've heard about TEDs or BRDs or birds, some people refer to them. Um, they reduce the number of turtles that actually enter crab pots. Um, there are commercial forms that are available. These are homemade ones that we made to do some of our original testing. Um, and there have been predominantly two size classes of TEDs that have been used on the East Coast. Um, the TED works essentially by restricting based on the height of the turtle. Um, and we initially did some work to demonstrate that probably the most effective size in Maryland would be um, one and three quarter inches high. There's also been substantial work done by Roger Wood, who should be credited for actually coming up with this idea of a bycatch reduction device. Um, where this distance is um, two inches. So in Maryland, we did um, some work where we looked at um, control pots, and what we see is that catch rates of terrapins are high. And here we see um, a test of a four centimeter high BRD, a four and a half centimeter high BRD, and a five centimeter high BRD. So what um, we're seeing is about 50% effectiveness with the five centimeter high and four and a half centimeter um, is about 80% effective. Um, and I just want to illustrate to you that uh, since we've done that, did those studies in the early 90s or late 90s, there have been lots of people who have done work on BRDs. And these are all different studies in all different states, including many of the Gulf states. And every single one of these studies where terrapins were caught shows that the BRDs effectively reduce the numbers of turtles that are caught. The only ones that didn't show an effect didn't catch any turtles or caught not, didn't catch enough turtles to actually um, create uh, a significant effect. The other thing that you can see if we look at the five um, inch high or five centimeter high is that their effectiveness is not as high as the four and a half um, centimeter um, BRD. Okay. So the next big question, of course, is what kind of impact do these um, BRDs have on the crab catch? And um, this is looking at um, blue crabs in Chesapeake Bay using our actual experiments. 
Um, we separate crabs into ones which are five and a half inches and up from point to point, twos which is five to five and a half inches, um, legal females and then peelers. Um, and if you do a um, logistic analysis of these data, the number of crabs, what you see um, is that there is no effect and there's no difference due to either the five and a half or the five centimeter um, BRDs, right? However, if we look throughout the range, if we look at the four and a half centimeter BRD and the impact on the crab fishery, what we see is um, there's no impact on crab size, which is um, sort of interesting. Um, but we do see that there are several studies in red here that um, identified a decrease with regard to the number of crabs that were actually caught within um, the crab pots. There was one study done by Roger Wood that um, um, created a 12% increase. But let's take a look at the five centimeter BRD. In the case of the five centimeter BRD, what we see is that uh, 13 out of 15 studies showed that there was no impact or there was actually an increase in the number of crabs that were being caught in the pots that were equipped with these BRDs. And one of these, interestingly enough, was done right here um, in the, the Gulf State region, right? Why are we seeing this increase in, um, in some studies? Uh, it was suggested by Roger Wood that things like golf, um, or sorry, whelks and um, spider crabs, which also end up in some crab pots and parts of the range, um, essentially compete with crabs within crab pots and that uh, um, they, the, the ability to exclude those from the crab pots contributed um, to an increase. Right. Nonetheless, the important take home message here is that there is a, you know, there is a viable solution. It's, it's not the best solution with regard to terrapins, but it can dramatically decrease the number of turtles that end up um, getting caught in um, crab pots. Right. Um, we're also working on a new BRD design. Um, these are the two traditionals, the two inch and the inch and a quarter high. Uh, Mike Arndt in the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources is experimenting with a new design uh, that's two and seven inch inches high by two inches or 7.3 by five centimeters. Um, he asked me, since we have a lot of turtles where I work, to, to test it out. Here we see the impact on terrapins, once again, consistently a dramatic decline in the number of turtles caught. Um, we haven't really got enough crabs yet to do a a, a strong statistical comparison, at least on the scale of a commercial fishery, um, but we're seeing um, some decrease in his BRD um, and also a slight decrease um, in size with regard to his BRD. But we're going to uh, implement another field season with regard to um, using this um, BRD. Okay, so that's the background rates, ways to reduce catches in background rates. Now let's talk about ghost crabs. Um, and derelict pots. Um, and uh, these are some of the examples. This is one that was found in Georgia, 103 turtles in it. This is one I found on my study site in 1989 on my birthday, happy birthday, um, uh, with 49. This one, again on my birthday, oh, it's a bad day. Um, anyway, uh, this one had 43 dead turtles in it. Um, so these are, um, of course, what hits the press. These are the things that give crab, crab pots a bad name um, and dramatically um, influence people's interpretation about the interactions between crab pots and crabs. However, as we've had a bunch of people say, we're doing our best to get these derelict crab pots out, and that's awesome. I would say that the Gulf states are way ahead of people in the Northeast in terms of trying to do this. New Jersey is the only state Maryland and Virginia have done a little bit, um, but for the rest, I don't. But this brings, brings up the question, how come there are not lots of turtles within these ghost pots? So this led us to do another study that I refer to um, as the, the rotter study. Um, and we took some terrapin carcasses that we had accumulated over the years. Um, and we did a um, study to quantify the decomposition rates. And we started off with fairly fresh turtles um, and then sort of scaled their de stages of decomposition and looked to see how long do these animals persist within um, crab pots. And what we discovered 
is that these animals, remember they're air breathing animals, they um, die within a few hours being in a submerged crab pot and they start to decompose very quickly and they're gone from crab pots in less than two weeks in the summertime. And if you um, look at in the summer and fall, the, when water temperatures are cooler, you get most of them disappear, especially smaller size classes. Um, and only some of the very largest ones do we find some um, little pieces of shell um, left behind. So one of the consequences of this is that um, you know, it's not surprising at all that we're not finding a lot of terrapins in these derelict crab pots, simply because they're rotted and gone. Um, and so uh, uh, trying to estimate what the catch rate is of the derelict gear based on the presence of shells in crab pots is not going to give an accurate estimate because um, of the disappearance of um, the shells, right? This is, sorry, days on the, uh, x-axis here, uh, rotting stage where 11 is, they're completely gone. And these are different size classes of terrapin, so small, medium, and these are the um, large females. Okay. The last thing I want to say at this point is sort of the serendipity that, that hit Maryland um, with regard, and Chesapeake Bay with regard to um, crab potting. Um, in 1942, Davis was commissioned by Maryland, who was then considering adopting the use of crab pots, and they restricted in Maryland the crab use of crab pots in the main stem um, of the bay and said, all these tidal tributaries and rivers and inlets, they are not allowed to have commercial fishing of crab pots. Virginia, on the other hand, does allow that, and the Virginia lot border is right here. Um, and you can see the extensive commercial fishery that does penetrate um, into these areas, right? And so what this has done is that it has provided a refuge where terrapins can essentially hide and get away from um, crab pots. Now, in 77, um, recreational use of crab pots has been allowed in these tributaries, and of course, that's contributing to population decline in areas where we see a lot of development and shoreline um, exploitation. All right. So um, in conclusion then, um, I'd just like to say that uh, both properly used and ghost pots contribute significantly to terrapin mortality um, and also that they can extirpate populations pretty quickly or um, create significant population decline for terrapins. This bycatch of terrapins in crab pots can be reduced by using um, TEDs or BRDs. Um, the five centimeter high BRD um, has a minimal effect on crab catch, um, but that uh, size impact varies throughout the range uh, of the study in terms of both terrapins that are prevented from getting in pots and um, turtles and crabs that are being caught. The other thing is that terrapin composition rates are rapid and therefore terrapin remains in um, that are used in ghost pots to try and estimate what the impact is um, are very likely underestimates of terrapin mortality. Um, also, that it is the near shore water um, crab pots that create problems for terrapins. Um, and to give you an example, um, three years ago I came down to um, Alabama and was in the field with Thane Wibbles and Ken Marion, and we went and explored up a, a, a back creek and found a crab pot that we were brave enough to pull up without being spotted by a commercial fisherman. And sure enough, it had um, three turtles um, in it, right? Uh, and so uh, the impact can be mitigated both in terms of perhaps regulating the waters where crabs are fished in combination with um, the use of BRDs. Um, and I wanna finish up by saying that the need for action in many states for crab, commercial crab fisheries um, is that suggests that the regulation might best be um, uh, mandated regionally or nationally as opposed to relying on individual states to try and um, move this, for, this effort forward. And I commend the Gulf States Fisheries Commission because you guys are the first guys to actually think about this stuff. The people on the East Coast are not thinking about this yet. Um, and uh, nor do we know when we can convince them to. So my applause to the Gulf 
State's Marine Fisheries Commission. Thank you. Our last speaker before the break is going to be Ryan Gandy from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and he's going to be speaking on terrapins, blue crabs, and identification of hotspots. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we initiated a uh, study in Florida to look at uh, some potential management um, um, mapping as well as a diamondback terrapin uh, hotspot and using traps around that hotspot. Um, what we were really looking at is we, it, in, right after the Deepwater Horizon, there was some work done uh, around an area called Lenark Reef, found a very robust population of terrapins there. Um, we thought this might be a great area to start looking at Florida-specific interactions between diamondback terrapins and uh, crab traps and actually be able to assess the impact, potential impact on that population. Uh, we also wanted to develop uh, search methodologies for actually detecting diamondback terrapins in different types of habitats. Any of you that know Florida, you go 60 miles, the habitat completely changes uh, from marsh to mangroves to what have you. Uh, so we wanted to look at that, especially for this area, as well as uh, look at what existing data we had to develop some hotspot maps to look at interactions between potential interactions between the fishery and known populations. Let's see. So, whoops. So this is Lenark Reef. Um, it's just a very small area. It's it's called a reef, but it's really a long-standing sandbar in the area. It does have vegetation and specifically heavy rack lines in the area. We didn't. We, in the area, we couldn't use chimney traps. Um, the boat traffic from recreational boat traffic precluded that. So we developed a what we were calling the tuba trap, kind of like ter uh, terrapin underwater breathing apparatus. So it's just a uh, busboy tote flipped upside down. You can see when we retrieved it the large volume of uh, air that gets released because we had to leave the traps overnight and we wanted to make sure we didn't kill any terrapins in the process since this was a uh, a specific colony that was being studied at the time. So what we did, uh, we used a standard design um, with different distances from shore. We had a series of five traps all the way out to um, a thousand feet from shore. Um, this is the large Lenark section, and then we actually had a small Lenark section here. So in the fall trapping, there we go. In 930 trap days in fall, we didn't have any terrapins caught at any distances from shore. Um, at the same time, dur during the uh, search methodology, uh, when we were working on different ways of, of looking for terrapins, we actually were able to find 187 terrapins caught by hand on the island during that period of time. We had various bycatch in the traps, which we recorded. In the spring study, we thought, okay, the distance from shore is not working very well. Why don't we look at trying to intercept the terrapins as they're going to come in and out of this nesting colony uh, to see what interactions we can get. So what we did is we set um, at a, a little over a meter depth all the way across uh, different sections of Lenark. This is actually the Gulf of Mexico is out here. Um, and we have a, a back bay with the land that runs behind us here. And we thought we'd be able to intercept the, the terrapins as they came and went through the area. Um, we also, at the same time, wanted to set some intertidal traps, basically mimicking ghost traps that may have uh, gotten washed up in storms or uh, gotten up on the shore. We used uh, those in a couple different areas here, as well as a second area on Lenark uh, a little further to the east. And so what we found in the submerged traps offshore in that one meter depth, um, only two terrapins were caught in 1,995 days of trapping. One was a female and the second was a female um, in those traps. In the intertidal traps here, we had 65 terrapins caught in 330 days. So we were definitely seeing that, that the location of the trap depth was very specific for where these 
terrapins were. Um, so for our kind of conclusions for this, the submerged traps, in Lenark, it was pretty rare to catch them in submerged traps. Uh, the, the, um, it was very unexpected for us. We went in thinking we would be able to really see that impact of those submerged traps or actively fish traps. Um, but we think that's because of some of the habitat type that's there, the depth of the water, um, as well as some of the trapping history. This is a not heavily trapped area of Florida, and I'll show you some, uh, some trapping numbers here in a minute. Um, but in the vegetated zone, we did see a uh, heavy catch, um, which does indicate to us that, that those uh, ghost traps are definitely an issue, um, especially with this colony is concerned. There we go. Um, so we wanted to develop search methodologies for this because what we notice is and there's that while there are studies on terrapins and terrapin habitat, one big thing when trying to assess impact is really looking at getting a good population assessment of your terrapins or your crabs or whatever you have out there that you're looking at impact for. So we, um, actually Eric Suarez, um, he searched at different tide levels during different weather patterns and in different types of habitat. Mainly uh, what works in that area is actually taking your shoes off, walking through the rack line and feeling the terrapins with your feet. And there's so many of them. I mean, we were, we were catching quite a few terrapins. It was very successful in this way. Now this is, again, it's a unique area for Florida, and we would anticipate any type of design would change, there we go, as you go through. So we did see um, significant impacts of the tide on, on, our, on our, um, our detectability, as well as what the weather was um, at the time, and what type of habitat they were in. Mainly vegetated, again, in this area, specifically under rack lines, because in the summer, Eric did some work with temperature differences in the area and trying to figure out why, how, how and why they were using the rack lines. A lot of it has to do with thermal regulation as well as um, being protected from predators. Um, so we're, the findings were for this specific habitat, which was uh, searching at low tide on clear, partly cloudy days was very beneficial. Um, and they used some sort of vegetative structure um, for during their day or during most of the days there. But it's very difficult to compare to a lot of other studies. And that's what we were looking at, that over time, that potentially developing different search methodologies for different regions so we could have regional population assessment for terrapins in Florida. Um, when we did uh, this study, we also did, or Eric did, um, a population assessment for Lenark, where we also pit tagged a lot of terrapins. And um, for, this, for this study, there were basically 800 uh, captures there, but 442 of those were new individuals to us in the eight months of study. This, this, this terrapin population has been tagged and studied multiple times in Florida. Um, we were able to get some population structure. Now, you have to remember this is a nesting beach, so we have uh, um, quite a few large, uh, uh, large uh, terrapins there. It's, it's biased towards males, uh, but females as well. And we had to use a closed population model because we hadn't done enough tagging to see what the, or how far our terrapins were moving between uh, the main shoreline. There's extensive Spartina marsh along the shoreline. So we, we figured the best way, the most conservative way to look at this was a closed population just around Lenark Reef. And our estimate was uh, right there, a little over 1,100 uh, terrapins using that location. The other part of this um, was our terrapin hotspot mapping. So what we did is we were able to, or our, our goal was to go in and use existing fisheries data with existing tra our, our terrapin population studies and develop uh, maps that would not only guide any, any investigations into those interactions between crab traps, but also help guide researchers into where there may be areas in Florida we have a paucity of data or no data at all on terrapins where it would be good to do investigations because what we do is we see a lot of overlapping terrapin studies in the same area. And that, while informative for that area, it neglects a lot of other uh, areas that aren't utilized. So we thought we would develop a tool for all researchers to use in this manner. So 
Sorry, my slides are going a little slow. There we go. So the first part of this data set was our uh, trip ticket data. For those of you who aren't familiar with trip tickets, a commercial fisherman comes in with his catch. He has to go in and, for example, if he was in Destin area, he would then um, either record 9.0, meaning his catch was offshore, or Choctawatchee Bay, or out in federal waters beyond the state waters. And so our different regions across Florida have the different bay system designations. This is about as fine as we get for uh, location. And as you'll see as we go along, um, there's some issues with that. So then we went to the databases that were available in 2011. We used a Big Bend survey where um, they had some terrapin, but there was also the Herp Atlas that came out in uh, 2011, 2012. Um, we have our Lenark Reef study where we had uh, uh, tagged 507, and then we accessed our fisheries independent monitoring. Now we have a real broad net approach to our fisheries independent monitoring program. So when they pull trawls, they use uh, stratified random designs. They're in all sorts of habitats within our bay system and our coastal systems. So they'll do trawls, seines, uh, several different types of seines. They record everything that comes up in the net. So when I went to our FIM group and started talking to them, I said, well, how many terrapins do you have? I said, well, we'll, we'll pull the data and see. Well, lo and behold, there were 641 terrapins caught in those gear. It's a fantastic uh, sample. They were all released alive. Most of our tow times were five, 10 minutes, so they could capture them. So this added a significant amount of data to what we have, but it also revealed where we have not much data on terrapins. So just to orient you to this, this is Pensacola. I'm gonna start in the Gulf and move around to the Atlantic. Um, we have, for example, Perdido Bay. The blue crab effort in trips is 97, but we don't have any terrapin uh, sightings in this area at that time that we were aware of. But you, we have the blue crabbing effort for each one of these regions, but there's no blue crabbing offshore. When we move to the east, uh, Destin area, we have one terrapin that was reported there, um, as well as in Panama City, one, ter or, uh, one terrapin here uh, reported there, and then one down in St. Joe Bay. As we continue to go east, our fisheries independent monitoring is where it brings in a lot of information because west of this area, we do not have a lot of fisheries independent monitoring in the Panhandle. So what we have is Appalachee Bay, we have, this is our second largest blue crabbing region. But what you're gonna see here is that we have a large component of our fishing area. This area, there were 4,400 trips, but those are offshore areas. They're not where we would think, we would think we would have a lot of interaction with terrapins um, until you get up into this transition zone. And what we see, a lot of our terrapin locations are in transition zones between two of our fisheries regions that get reported on trip tickets. It's just the level of resolution of this data set. However, we were able to pull in where this is the Lenark one standout is 500 terrapins caught there during our study, but others have collected 15 in our FIM samples. There's uh, so nesting studies done along the Big Bend here, uh, as well as uh, terrapins collected. And then down in Cedar Key area, where we have another FIM location, we have a lot of terrapins located there. So I'm not gonna go into each one of these, but it's a good example of how at least there's a tool, Tampa Bay, where you can see regions where there is no data on terrapins, either because there wasn't research or um, we didn't have FIM samples from those. And you can see regions where we have a lot of blue crab interaction. As we get down to the Everglades, this um, you'll notice there's, there's very limited trapping because this is Everglades National Park, uh, and then a lot, uh, quite a few terrapins. But as we go to the Keys, very few terrapin sightings up the East Coast. And where we really start seeing them pick back up is right around uh, Cape Canaveral area, where we have our third biggest blue crabbing area. Again, 7,000 trips in this area. As we go north, um, looking back into St. John's River, which is our river that runs north, you can see the salinity gradient here and that we have blue crabbing, just no terrapins and you, until you start getting into this higher salinity region. And as you get up into the Jacksonville area, we have an abundance of terrapins recorded there. And this is one of our largest blue crabbing regions where we have 137 terrapins recorded up here in St. Mary's, 
Um, in the Nassau, we've got 191, and then uh, the terrapin collected down here in this lower part is about 115. Now, the nice thing about that FIM data set, it gives a latitude and longitude for every single terrapin that gets collected. So it's a high, much higher resolution for where these terrapin hotspots are, and there may be some more utility to that as we go along. If anybody was ever interested in accessing this, we actually have made it available as a, you can either download it in, in a GIS format or you can download it into just Google Maps and it'll populate with those specific Terrapin locations and the uh, blue crab, the, the maps that were on there. But you can also zoom in and find those specific Terrapin hotspots. So that was just a tool we came up with. Um, again, I don't do management, I sit on the biological side, but we wanted to really work with um, our, our internal Terrapin uh, biologists and try to come up with some products that may be a starting point for if there were areas that we needed to look at that we could specifically target for any type of management and interaction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? We have a, a minute for questions for Ryan or if anybody has questions for any of our other speakers before we go to break. We have one final talk this morning. It's going to be Tom Mormon from the Mississippi chapter of the Nature Conservancy. He's also the Gulf Coast Regional Representative for the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group. And Tom will be speaking about collaborative efforts across the Gulf region. All right, thank you, Christina. Uh, as she introduced me, my name is Tom Mormon. I'm the Director of Marine Programs for the Nature Conservancy here in Mississippi. I've been with the Mississippi chapter for seven years now, and I've been working on things in the coastal zone <coughs> primarily. Okay. Uh, just a quick personal note, I've gotten into the habit of putting my acknowledgments as my second slide because sometimes you get so excited to get to the end that you forget to thank the people that helped put your work together. So first off, I'd like to thank Stephen uh, for putting this session together. I also would like to thank uh, Will Selman, who's currently a professor at Millsaps College. Uh, Will is the regional co-chair so, or co-representative, so there's actually two of us that are the regional representatives for the Gulf Coast for the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group here along the Gulf Coast. And some of the the work I'm going to be talking about later on was a, a project submitted through the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group with Amy Willard as the PI. So Amy Willard is the junior chair. Christina Mormon is the senior chair of the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group. Okay. So my presentation has two parts. Essentially, I'm going to be looking at a collaboration among the members of the uh, Terrapin Working Group along the Gulf Coast. And then I'm going to uh, give an example of how that collaboration translates into uh, actually implementation of a potential project. Uh, quick reminder, uh, there are several subspecies of diamondback terrapins. Here's a, a brief outline of their uh, distribution in the different subspecies. Diamondback terrapin habitat typically consists of an aquatic well, it doesn't typically, it is an aquatic habitat with also associated beach nesting areas. Uh, those beach nesting areas can include sand, sh shell hash, and a variety of other uh, substrates that are above the high tide line. Uh, other submerged habitats are typically here along the Gulf Coast, the Spartina juncus marsh, uh, and then over in the Keys area you have uh, mangroves that are nesting areas for terrapins. Some typical threats are uh, Mortality related to uh, drowning in fishing gear, uh, road mortality, so uh, in parts of their range, especially along the Atlantic coast, as development occurred, causeways were created to get out to barrier islands. Those causeways are prime nesting areas because they're above the high tide line and uh, pretty easy to dig into. So there's a lot of road mortality in other parts of their region. Uh, nest predation has been mentioned several times. Uh, and also alterations to their physical habitat, whether it's uh, 
nesting beach areas or uh, wetlands habitats, which they, they forage and live in. Uh, land cover changes over time have, have also likely impacted terrapin or are typically listed as a threat for the species. All right, so Christina introduced today's talk with an overview of the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group. Just to refresh, there are five regional working groups. There's a uh, leadership team in place that also uh, kind of facilitates a lot of this work. Um, it's a nonprofit organization, as I mentioned before. The three or the five different groups are Gulf Coast, Florida, Southeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Northeast. The photograph you see there is from our regional meeting that we held in Lafayette uh, in February of 2015. So that's the last time that we met as a working group. Um, typically our working group meetings have uh, a session where we do presentations divided up into various categories, typically by state. In this case, we did kind of an overview of those, uh, sort of a state update for each of the five Gulf states, but we also wanted to, to make use of everyone's time together. So we kind of put together a sort of conservation planning exercise. Uh, this was a facilitator-led uh, effort to basically assess where uh, research conservation and outreach uh, issues stood. So what were the gaps that we needed? What was the situation? So it was an analysis basically to, to get a first glimpse of what was going on in the region and what were the needs that we needed to be thinking about. This was the first group of the regional meeting in several years also, so it was kind of a good time to get everyone together and kind of reassess where we were. And as I'd mentioned before, this is an, an effort to come out with some sort of a tangible project product rather than just uh, you know getting together and updating each other, which is very useful in itself, but also coming away with a meeting with materials that can be used to you know advance a, the conservation needle or, or uh, restoration needle, however you want to think about that. We uh, self-selected into three groups. Uh, so the, the group you saw up there had representatives from academics, uh, state management agencies, federal management ag agencies, and also a variety of NGOs. TNC was represented by me. We had folks from Audubon as well. So we had coverage from all five Gulf states, if I remember correctly. Uh, Louisiana was a pretty good location, I think, being fairly central to getting folks from uh, Texas and all the way from Alabama. So the Gulf Coast group consists of uh, the four Gulf states officially. Florida is its own unit, but we tend to reach out into the panhandle. So we do have folks from Escambia, Pensacola area that come over and sort of tag both, both of those different groups. As you can see, we had approximately 20 people in the research section as represented by the probably heavy academic affiliation we had. We had about 10 in the conservation section and then five in the uh, outreach management area. Um, each group was given the same set of questions, a worksheet to basically work through so that we would all kind of come out and come back to our back together time to report out on what was found. So the next section is going to be essentially some of that reporting out. And this is just to kind of give you an overview of of where the working group, a lot of what our effort has been as far as how we're thinking and, and what terms we're looking at. Um, some justification or reasoning behind doing conservation planning is, you know, first off, there's a whole world of different plans out there. Uh, there's a couple listed there, species management, watershed, conservation action plans, state wildlife management plans. They all have specific uh, reasons for being. So what you want to do when you're going into a planning effort is make sure what you're trying to, what your end game is, is what you're actually planning for. So you don't necessarily need some big elaborate uh, management plan when a conservation action plan will do. So you want your, your strategy to be right size for, for the effort that you're about to put in. Uh, successful plans obviously link to funding sources, conservation priorities, and research needs, but also connect to other plans that already exist in implementation. So when you don't have to reinvent something, there's no need to, to do that. Um, they should include goals that are in particular measurable uh, and also typically include things like situational analyses, threat assessments, scope strategies, and action items. 
uh, basically what is your goal and how are you going to get there. All right, so these are all listed as action items, but these are probably in this case more along the lines of things that need further research. So this was the research section summary. Uh, this is, there's a couple slides here, so this isn't the whole thing, but uh, first off, diamondback terrapin population ecology, so things like physiology, survivorship, distribution. Um, there's a lot of good research going on in the Gulf with terrapins, and the working group has several members that are doing that, but there are still areas that are understudied. Uh, other things under this list include habitat, so things like nesting, site selection at a fine scale, uh, these in th include things like vegetation and substrate. Uh, predation, who are the predator predators and what are their behavior? In different areas, it could be different animals doing the work. And site restoration, so what is the suitability of actual uh, restored sites? Are those places being right si or right sited? Uh, and how does uh, diamondback terrapins interact with that? And I think that's an important one when we start thinking about uh, restoration investments that are coming along the way through the, the various funding streams of, of Deepwater Horizon. Uh, also uh, looking at marsh habitat under habitats. Uh, what areas do they utilize? What are salinity tolerances? Basically just trying to get a better understanding of, of how terrapins interact with their environment. Right. Additionally, they went on to, to look at prey communities as an area that could use some more research, um, isolation and connectivity, looking at the distribution. Uh, I think gene flow and uh, genetics plays into that section as well. Crab fisheries did come up, and that was basically, you know, looking at where hotspots between terrapin populations in the fishery exist, and also uh, looking to conduct more derelict crab studies um, and crab trap surveys. So that, that need fits very nicely into the fact that we're having this meeting today. So it's a good uh, synergy there. Uh, looking at behavior, ha hatchling dispersion. Uh, what are the winter habitat usages along the coast? Uh, behavior of displaced individuals following hurricanes and also social behavior. Uh, translocation and reintroduction came up. Uh, what is the feasibility of relocating adults? Does it work? Uh, and basically, uh, finally, to develop a study network among researchers to coordinate with each other. So this was, this was kind of the first take on this, and I forgot to mention, uh, one of the main reasons I was thanking Will Selman is because he actually presented a version of this talk and these results uh, approximately a year ago at the Turtle Survival Alliance. They had a special terrapin session there. I unfortunately wasn't able to make, but this is a similar, this is pretty much the same material, just reformatted a little bit. Uh, looking ahead to conservation and management. Uh, challenges for the most part, uh, or include things that we've probably all seen before, uh, money is difficult to receive because terrapins aren't a listed species. As we've noted earlier today, they are listed in some cases as a state special species of special concern, but uh, there is no uh, federal uh, uh, designation, obviously. Uh, conservation efforts are not typically related to habitat. Uh, that being said, I think that information might be starting to skew a little bit differently now. I think, again, with all the restoration that's coming down our way, looking at restoring barrier islands or islands and uh, beneficial use programs, that that is definitely changing, that there is a more uh, there's a much bigger emphasis on habitat restoration than there was uh, several years ago. Uh, let's see, little coordination among groups who have similar interests. So in the case of this meeting, uh, bird nesting uh, was, you know, a group that was identified, but obviously, you know, there's an overlap between the, the task force here or the Marine Fisheries Commission that should also be included. So that also speaks to conservation at a scale that encompasses multiple species, not necessarily just for terrapins, but for all the associated critters that hang out with them in their habitats. Uh, action items include uh, creating a management plan for the Gulf of Mexico region. So that's 
part of what, what this is looking to, to move towards. Uh, development of goals to inform recommendations, mitigation actions, and BMPs. Uh, another part of that is to develop essential uh, maps of, of habitat. So not necessarily a, a designated uh, habitat, but just basically what are the key areas that are needed for, for terrapins in and along the coast. Uh, identification of protected areas, known localities and nesting beaches, and areas of high commercial fishing activity. For the education section, uh, we came up with basically just a couple of things uh, to increase outreach to uh, different uh, Terrapin stakeholders. Uh, the suggestion of creating an, an educator's toolbox was was put out there. And essentially, there's a lot of information already in existence that educators use in different states. Um, but a lot of that, you have to kind of search, and, and it's difficult to find, even doing internet searches. Uh, so it was encouraged to put all those together and kind of do a a sweep of the, of the coastal states and figure out what works as far as education and outreach goes and put all those things in one place to create sort of a toolbox that could then be uh, utilized locally by anyone's particular program to tailor it towards the stakeholder group that they're attending to re attempting to reach out to. Also outreach uh, efforts to include were to include expansion of the uh, or promotion of the, the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group via Facebook, promoting activities of our colleagues such as der derelict crab trap removals, volunteer opportunities, and then other general science uh, reports from active research. So kind of being a, a spot for folks to go to for uh, getting information on what's currently happening with terrapins uh, throughout the, their range. All right, so what does application of this coordination and this collaboration look like? So recently, the Gulf of Mexico Alliance had an RFP out for the Gulf Star program. And the Wildlife and Fisheries team had a section in there where they were requesting the, uh, a couple focus areas, one of which included the identification and catalog of key beach nesting areas and foraging areas for species of concern, including seabirds, terrapins, uh, beach mice, piping plovers, and sea turtles. So this seemed like a, a good opportunity to actually put in place or put into action some of the, the things that we were talking through that management plan. Or not management plan, but uh, first kind of outline that we threw together. So the main consideration for this was there's a lot of terrapin research that's already been done on beach nesting habitat areas. A lot of these have been identified and studied. Uh, this is a, a map that Will had put together, um, identifying you know some study areas in the Gulf of Mexico. It's not supposed to be all inclusive. It's just kind of thrown together. But you know, essentially, a lot of that information already exists with different people. So the important thing that we were looking to do was to collaborate with those folks rather than go out and do a bunch of field work, which wasn't really feasible with the funding that was available. So use the resources that are available. So in collaboration with the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group, we put together a proposal to do just that. Uh, from, from those folks on, that have attended uh, working group meetings, we solicited a request to say, hey, do you want to be on the project team? And, can we borrow your, your data for a little while? And we got a very good response. So the project proposal, this is only a proposal. We haven't been awarded anything yet. But uh, we were able to get uh, support from each of the five Gulf states, and in many cases, multiple supporters from the five Gulf states. So we already have a project implementation team, if we were to get funded, to be able to get most of this data right away. Um, the idea is having a very open and collaborative approach in order to, to get data that you need for your deliverables, but also it's a way for folks to engage and interact with each other at a landscape level rather than at our just local uh, bayou or estuary or, or state level. Uh, through that process, we, at, we also went through a uh, 
input from different stakeholders and team members, so we got a lot of feedback, letters of support, et cetera. And then ultimately the proposal was submitted by the National Diamondback Terrapin Working Group through Amanda Willard, who is, I mentioned before, the junior co-chair and will be the senior co-chair next year, I believe. All right, so what are the objectives of this project? Uh, are basically to identify key nesting areas, current and historic. We want to evaluate the current beach habitat for health and viability and also potential threats. A lot of my background in the last couple of years has been in conservation planning or the, or the CAP process that some of you all may have seen in other places. So a lot of how this project was put together was informed through that experience. Um, so instead of just looking at where turtles nest, it seemed like a good opportunity to figure out what the viability of those nesting areas are currently, historically, and in the future. So it's not just there's a dot on a map and we know where they are, but it's where do we expect them to be farther on down the road. Um, and those sorts of viability and health assessments would be informed through various workshops and getting information from various stakeholders and interested in terrapins or beach nesting habitat. Um, and then the other part of the, the final objective was basically to use this as an example of how uh, different individuals can be collaborative together to work on a scale much greater than what we typically do. So basically kind of a gestalt of bringing the various parts together to, to make your, your whole, the, the sum greater than the whole, I think is what I'm getting at. No, I messed that up, but that's okay. Um, but basically trying to make everyone's individual parts amount to something that's a little bit greater than, than what it would be as a standalone. All right, so in, in putting this together, it's important to note it, that it very deliberately, we, we work this so that it fits in with things like the governor's action plan, the state wildlife plan, not just with Mississippi, for example, but with the other five Gulf states. So we were trying to find those linkages between all that existing work that's been done before and make sure that we're actually supporting the state agencies or the federal agencies uh, and you know other NGOs that are, that are supporting this work. Uh, one of the, the more important applications of this project potentially, I think, is where you have the intersection of uh, restoration investments and terrapin nesting habitat. So uh, one of the things I believe we put in the proposal was to conduct outreach to our technical information groups or implementation groups or TIGs. So there's a variety of, of these. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but basically, you know, try to, to get this information out if we find some areas of overlap and hopefully that can help inform restoration decisions moving down the road. Um, application of this coordination I I think the, the whole point of what I'm, I'm why I'm displaying this is I think within the Diamondback Terrapin working group for those of you that are working in crab fisheries or both is that you have a ready-made uh, group of individuals that are available to to work with uh, we are very open inclusive and collaborative and and want to talk to you all want to reach out and interact with you so it's difficult to have those conversations when you start meeting strangers for the first time. But, you know, we're all on the same team, I think, for the most part. And there's an opportunity here, and that's, that's what I think we're looking at. Uh, so specifically here, what I wrote down was working at a state level, we might be able to identify possible collaborators, uh, basically looking at overlapping research or conservation goals. And I didn't mention outreach and education, but that should also be included in there. At a regional level, uh, we, we are a very loose organization, but uh, we are communicating across state lines. And it would be useful to maybe consider us when you're looking at implementing or uh, not implementing, but talking about things at a regional scale. Uh, to also be noted that if you're thinking about doing outreach into the Terrapin community, community although the working group is, is great and there's a lot of good folks in there, they don't represent necessarily every Terrapin researcher and conservationist in existence. But we do have friends and we can help you get to some of those other people that, that may be working out there. 
So it's you know a good place to start, but it isn't necessarily uh, everybody. So just kind of an aside. <laughs> so I don't know how fast I went, but maybe I went too long or too short. But okay. So if anyone wishes to contact me, uh, my email is tmormon at tnc.org. And then the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group has a web page, which is just simply dtwg.org. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. everyone. Up until this point, we've been displaying the presentations for everyone who's viewing online, and we're switching to camera mode so that the folks who are online can see what's going on in the room. They can see the panel and everything. And while we're getting that set up, do we, do we have audio already if they introduce themselves? Okay. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves while we're getting the camera and everything set up, that'd be great. Uh, Jeff Marks, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Glenn Sutton, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Coastal Fisheries. Craig Newton, Alabama Marine Resources. Rick Burris, Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. Ryan Gandy, Florida Fish and Wildlife. Harriet Perry, Gulf Coast Research Laboratory. So I guess what we need to do is go ahead and start down the list. Who is first on the agenda for giving an overview? Glenn. Glenn, we're going to start in Texas. So 
go ahead and just kind of give some background, some of the programs, some of the activities that y'all are doing, and uh, as soon as we can get the camera working, everybody can see your pretty face. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. So uh, in Texas, we, we don't really have any uh, terrapin regulations to uh, other than we have a, a, a regulation that people should not uh, intention, intentionally uh, target terrapins, uh, and they're not allowed to possess them. Um, so apart from that, that, that wouldn't cover bycatch and traps, of course, but uh, there's, there's that degree of protection. Other than that, uh, we're, we're, we're examining possible uh, laws that would help uh, terrapins. Um, so currently, uh, within the Coastal Fisheries Division, we have a uh, Dr. Tiffany Hopper, who is examining, uh, <coughs> looking at uh, using uh, the excluded devices uh, in crab traps in Texas, and and look at how it would affect uh, bike uh, uh, catch of blue crabs and uh, how if it would exclude terrapins, um, and she's doing it using the uh, a real-world fishery within Texas, and so once we get that information, uh, we'll be able to better address how how these uh, TD um, these BRDs might work uh, for the Texas fishery. Um, another thing we've looked at is we have a, a, a biologist with us called Emma Clarkson, who worked with uh, George Gillian at the uh, University of Houston Clear Lake, uh, and they went they spent a lot of time. Um, uh, mapping uh, terrapin uh, observations and uh, encounters and the idea is to get the hot spots and the areas where there would be nesting sites or where you'd probably most likely find or encounter a terrapin. Um, and so we've been looking at that and, and one, of the, uh, one, thing, one of the things we've been thinking about is possibly uh, trying to give some protection to those areas that were hot spots. So I noticed in one of the presentations that they uh, that they were talking about putting together some maps that, that, that we could look at, and I think that would be a, an interesting thing to look at down the road. Um, apart from that, uh, you know, we're, we're just, we're open to any suggestions that would help. And obviously we've got to go through processes to get regulations put into place, but, you know, we definitely are open and, and uh, anything we can help, you know, we would definitely entertain and try to do that. And that's that's pretty much what I, all I've got. So if anybody has any comments that they want to contribute or questions they want to ask of Texas specifically, this is your chance. If not, we'll move on to the next state and work down the list. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so um, as far as Louisiana goes, um, Mr. Pearson down there that you heard his um, presentation earlier, they've been doing most of the work um, as, as it involves diamondback terrapins. Um, I think we're sort of in a holding pattern as far as the crab management side of things, waiting to get an idea of a better population estimates, where they are, where they're located, um, and, and then most likely moving towards um, using that information in, in the management side of things. Um, the department, uh, the marine fishery side, just is usually our, our efforts are directed in uh, working with the derelict crab traps, cleaning them up. Um, and I think that's probably where we'll go when we start getting these population um, estimates of where, where these diamondback terrapins are located. We can focus efforts with, with derelict crab trap cleanups and, and um, and get get uh, it, um, Julie had a good slide that showed sort of a decline in the in the uh, activity with our derelict crab trap program down to 2011. Well, it's it's taken an uptick here um, in the last couple of years. Um, we've we've gone from you know 400 traps I think in 2014, and and um, we've gone up to you know 1,500, 2,500, and just this past year we had 5,600 traps removed. So. Um, I think using using that effort and d focusing it to where it'll do the most good um, is is really where we're we're concerned. Um, that's that's really it as far as as research goes. Like I said, um, Mr. Pearson down at, at Rockefeller, they're they're handling a lot of the 
um, Diamondback Terrapin specific work where we just sort of uh, roll along with the fisheries, deal with commercial fishermen and that sort of thing. That's all I've got. Short, but. All right, so I think you got the gist of what Mississippi's doing <clears throat> in terms of terrapin conservation to the, to the uh, presentation that I gave earlier. Um, but <clears throat> we do have a couple of studies ongoing, uh, getting fishery independent, fishery dependent information through uh, um, through the research lab and through and through the uh, Office of Marine Fisheries, where we're looking at the uh, catch per unit effort in the recreational trap fishery and the catch per unit effort in the uh, um, commercial fishery and I, I can speak for for the DMR <clears throat> um I'm, I, I mentioned that we we believe most of it, that, that that the commercial fishery doesn't have a whole lot of, have a have a really large impact on terrapin mortality due to we have areas closed to uh commercial trap fishing but but if if there's any it's going to probably be more involved with the uh, recreational fishery. So looking at the bycatch information that we have the past three years, we've been uh, doing CPUE studies and um, running traps every week uh, in all of our major base systems in the areas that are close to commercial fishing. And uh, the, the bycatch is very minimal, um, I want to say probably out of uh, over a, 700 800 traps is probably about a dozen or so uh terrapins caught but we're, we're, we're continuing to to do that and like i said in in the presentation all of our effort not all of our effort the the majority of of our effort to get these teds and or birds to uh to the fishermen is, is within the recreational fishery because those are the ones that are fishing close to shore fishing in shallow water and closer to, to a terrapin habitat and Throughout the years, we've gotten a lot of TEDs and a lot of traps, and we're going to continue to do so. And um, I think towards the end of the current program we're in that's funded by NOAA Fisheries, we're, we're going to uh, get a survey out and see, you know, how many people. We know we've given them TEDs, but we're going to see how many people are actually fishing these TEDs and, and seeing what they what they like and what they dislike about them, and hopefully continue to encourage them to, to put those in their trap. Um, do you want to talk about the commercial CPUE? Oh, the laboratory works. Uh, the laboratory works closely with uh, MDMR, and we've been doing a catch punitive effort study with our commercial fishermen. Uh, we go out every other week. Uh, we record uh, everything that comes up in those traps. Uh, so we have very good information on on bycatch data, and I'll just emphasize what Rick just said. Uh, we have taken very few terrapins uh, in literally the thousands and thousands of traps that over since 19, or 2007 that we've been conducting this survey. Uh, the biggest bycatch, and it's similar, I think, in the northern Gulf, spade fish, pinfish, um, invertebrates, uh, oyster drills, the hermit crab, clybinarius, uh, hardhead catfish. So that that's been the primary bycatch, and I would for the bio for the crab biologists who are here introduce uh, Ken Marion. I know you terrapin people know him, but Ken did a lot of work in Alabama uh, with diamondback terrapin. I don't know if you might want to say something. Um, and then Tracy Floyd, whose dad Pete Floyd is a commercial crab fisherman. Um, who I think even started before Ken looking at uh, terrapins in, in, in Mississippi. And, and we're going to continue doing our daily crab trap cleanup. So we, we'll probably have one, try to have one next year because of all the storms we've had this, this, this past year. But and, and as, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll continue to come up with innovative ways to remove these traps and um, just go on from there. Any questions for Mississippi? Can I ask one question? Is that allowed? Yeah. Okay. Um, how many states currently have a recreational crab trap license in the Gulf? Is it just Mississippi? Louisiana and Mississippi. So you all are actually able to target people putting traps out 
if you were to put TEDs in them or encourage the use of TEDs because you know your universe better? Okay. All right. I just didn't remember who all was involved with, with recreational uh, quantification. I, I'm not. How many do y'all have recreationally, Rick? Uh, y'all have. Car, currently, or last year, we had 800, 800 license. Yeah, ours go up. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I want to say it was somewhere in the 8,000 ish range. <laughs> so that's a lot of TEDs for handing out, you know. But it, it would be a start. And Steve, we're actually working with the recreational fishermen doing a catch punitive effort where we uh, have contracted with, with fishermen and we record uh, all of their information on a bi weekly basis. Anyone else? Alabama? All right, thank you, Steve. <clears throat> So the, uh, the the most critical or the most uh, productive uh, terrapin habitats along Alabama are along Cedar Point and Heron Bay, and and uh, a portion of those of those Heron Bay waters are are close to crabbing. Uh, most of the bayous and and tidal creeks that are uh, that would be you know conducive uh, uh, conducive for, uh, for for terrapin habitat are similarly close to regulation. Um, and some of the other areas that, uh, that might be suitable habitat, uh, such as Dolphin Island Bay or, uh, or Oyster Bay or, you know, some of the secondary bays, Portersville, um, you know, some of those areas don't, uh, don't really receive that much effort. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, nonetheless, they're, they're, they're still, still open for crabbing. Um, and over the past year, we've made these uh, the, the rectangular TEDs available to the fishery. Um, you know, unfortunately, none of the uh, none of the commercial commercial guys have uh, have have taken that opportunity to to take the free TEDs that we've offered them. Um, but a handful of the of the recreational crabbers have have taken them and and implemented them into their into their traps that are uh, you know that they they place closer to shore. Uh, we also perform a derelict crab trap removal program. Uh, you know, honestly, I'm not sure when it started, but over the, the history of the of the program, uh, we've documented uh, less than 10, 10 terrapins uh, in uh, inside or as bycatch in the uh, uh, in the derelict traps. And we have funding for that uh, derelict removal program uh, through 2019. We also have a new regulation that will help out with uh, with the reduction of, of derelict traps. Uh, fishermen are able to uh, to reclaim abandoned crab traps if they go through a, a process of uh, uh, working with AMRD officials and and uh, you know validating that it truly is an abandoned trap. They can they can uh, take possession of the trap and, and repurpose it for their use and actually monitor uh, monitor that, that that trap. So. Um, and also during the past year, we've we've been conducting uh, at sea observer uh, trips with the commercial crab fishermen. Uh, you know, however many thousands of, of traps that have been uh, that, that we've we've seen uh, seen pulled up and documented bycatch and uh, and everything. We haven't documented any any uh, uh, turtle uh, interactions. Uh, but also with that being said, uh, we haven't had any trips that are that are inside uh, inside Heron Bay, which would be the, the most most productive uh, diamondback terrapin habitat. So, uh, but, and we're going to continue doing that. Continue uh, recording recording bycatch and uh, and continuing this this observer program. So that's it. Any questions? Hey, um, well, for Florida, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so I handle the crab side of things and crab fishery side of things. We also have Tracy Castellon that handles uh, some of the coordination of our terrapin work. Um, we have several uh, studies going on in the state, um, but 
we what what um, one of the big issues or one of the big challenges I should say with Florida is much like Louisiana, we have an extensive coastline. Um, we have changing habitats throughout that coastline uh, that make sampling much more challenging. And so I think one of the big uh, things we have to look at is given the small amount of funding that's actually available for terrapin work and the, the great need for population studies, I think, is driving some of the research we see, which are focusing either on genetic studies, um, looking at different habitats that may be focal points for either future research or at least identifying areas that are of concern. Uh, because you, one thing to convey um, to a lot of people who don't deal directly with fisheries, it's a multi-layered cake of uh, different competing issues as well as issues that you have to prioritize throughout. And that's why I say continuously that what, with the, on, on the side of what we need from terrapins, uh, in, in my point of view, is that uh, you need a more comprehensive population studies. Uh, at least focus in different areas so we can identify what, if it's a hot spot, what size of the population is being impacted, what the impacts for that specific region are, because what we find is by that changing habitat, our crabbers change the way they fish, they change the seasons they fish in, so it, it becomes very complicated in that we may have uh, some of our crabbers fish a few thousand traps, but they can fish all the way from the offshore in the Gulf of Mexico in state waters all the way up into springs or lakes or rivers. So I think helping us to, with better descriptions of the of the habitats that are getting used, the focal areas uh, and impact studies is is a way to catalyze uh, the the faster understanding of in Florida what we're dealing with and which regions are the most important to focus on. Because if anything, it's it's just a huge coastline with with a lot of limited resources. So. I would always encourage, I know the, the Gulf Working Group really pulls in Florida up to the panhandle, and then we have a Florida group. So reaching out to our Florida group in that same fashion is, is another thing we need to do, but to work together to try to help coordinate and focus on specific areas and, and have the understanding clear in that area and then move on to another one would be very helpful, along with encouraging a lot of, I know, like all of us, we either have graduate students or we have... Uh, people that do studies and then move on to other things, but working within our own groups, whether it's the crab groups where we know there's data of no catch or terrapin catch to get that data out there and publish, but as well as the studies that are out there that are five, ten years old on terrapins that have population data that will be very important to get into the light of day um, because I, I think in a very short period of time with both groups working together, there's a possibility to, to, to bring, uh, to, to be able to look at the issue uh, from all sides, but at population levels and at impact levels, so we can have uh, productive conversations going forward. Um, so that's it. But uh, Florida, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Dave, can we ask questions? I wanted to I wanted to ask William, do you have the same relationship with your fisheries commissions along the Atlantic coast uh, that you have the opportunity to attend those meetings and, and, and work with those folks in the way that the Gulf has banded together to address the issue? No, um, we don't. Um, the I know there's there's an Atlantic Coast Marine Fisheries Group um, and then the National Marine Fisheries Group, but they, I don't think terrapins have even come up on their radar. I, my work has been focused mainly in Maryland. Um, up until 2007, terrapins were actually a commercial fishery, and so they were both managed by um, the fisheries unit of DNR within the state both crabs and terrapins, and so there was some opportunity to do some stuff. Um, we closed the fishery for terrapins, which shifted the management of terrapins over to wildlife and management, and now it's become virtually impossible for the two branches of the same agency, Maryland DNR, to work together towards developing some 
good strategies. Um, the BRDs that are required in the recreational fishery in Maryland were done prior to um, the, the, the split. But um, if I may, I'd like to ask a collective question of the, the panel, and that is given that we've got so much data that shows that BRDs are effective at keeping turtles out of crab pots. And you know, I think the, the, the history of terrapins, their overexploitation that occurred in the previous century, previous two centuries, and their slow recovery is in part a consequence of a, you know, an active crab pot fishery why not move forward and require BRDs in all crab pots across all of the Gulf states? This is a unique opportunity here to be able to, you know, to, to, to agree that the crab pot, that, that BRDs don't affect the numbers of crabs that you are catching. Um, I think the data are pretty clear with a large number of studies now that have been done you know, both within the Gulf states and up and down the East Coast, but they are also effective at keeping turtles out of crab pots. So what keeps your agencies from moving forward with this idea? Um, and I would like to suggest that, you know, we're seeing terrapin habitat become, you know, be very specific. And perhaps one of the reasons it's not more general is because crab pots over the last 70 to 80 years have um, put a selective pressure for terrapins that are exclusively in those habitats where crab pots are not. Um, and so this would give perhaps terrapin populations the opportunity to expand and um, move into regions that they formerly used to occupy before crab pots were there and before we had the extensive commercial harvest of terrapins. That's a $64,000 question. <laughs> well, I, I think it is. I think it, it's, it's a complicated issue. I think, um, you know, what you're seeing with the group here and our managers in the room is that we're aware and there's an awareness and we're, we're looking into, uh, from our aspect, the, bio, the biological side of things. But also there's, there's a need from the stakeholder groups if it, if, to, to press some of these issues, to, to push them forward, um, to show that there is, you know, we, we have a need for this. Because I think making any gear you have more selective is an objective we all have. I mean, having targeted fisheries, um, when you look at the shrimp fisheries and, and that sort of thing. But I think also with that um, has to be, we have to look on balance and with the impacts to the fishery itself, to the terrapins themselves, but also have the monitoring in place to show the efficacy on both sides. Because you, as we expand projects out from a project that's gone on in a certain habitat with a certain type of, of uh, specific excluder device, as we expand that out to the fishery at large, how do we ensure that we're, we're making that trap as, as selective as possible within the regions that it's applicable. And the challenge with that is also making it enforceable, uh, something to where we have, and, and I think those are some of the challenges that will be wrestled with over time. But that's at least, you know, I think that selectivity is important and we're all wrestling with that. So I just might comment with regard to um, enforcing BRDs. Um, I think a cosmopolitan regulation that would, you know, for the entire state for recreational and commercial crab pots is really where it needs to go because we have in Maryland required BRDs or birds, tets, whatever you want to call them, in the recreational fishery, but not in the commercial fishery. And so you can buy crab pots as a recreational fishery without birds on them. And as a consequence, one of the things that we see is that our compliance rates are really bad in the recreational fishery. It's less, in some areas, it's around less than 5%. In some other areas, it's as high as 35%. And there's, there's no enforcement either. So that's, you know, that, that's a state problem. But they are, for political reasons that you guys are, I'm sure, all aware of um, when it comes to BRDs and 
terrapin conservation, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources has been told not to enforce the regulation. So, yeah, and and I and I think one of the challenges, one of the challenges you may face uh, that that you kind of face with us is is the location of the um, the fishery itself. It's a challenge in that uh, we have crabbers that will fish offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, eight nine miles. You know, they, they there's no need you know in those regions. But it's really, and that's why I keep pushing for some identification of, of populations, populations of concern, a band of habitat, suitability of habitat, that sort of thing that gives meets and bounds to base, uh, to, to base a lot of these recommendations on. Because when you look at Maryland, I mean, you've got to, compared to the coastlines we have, it's a fairly small area. Um, it's it's much more enforceable where you have large expanses in Florida that have no terrapins in them, but then you have a band of salinity or a band that, that may change that that's where your your most effectiveness is, and I think that's the big challenge for us um, is is figure it would be to figure out within each region as you change coastlines what the most appropriate areas are. So. So why not have a cosmopolitan rule that says BRDs everywhere? Well, I think from the perspective of the fishermen, uh, traps are pretty expensive. And, and if he's fishing in an area that he knows he will not impact terrapin populations, that's an added expense for him. Uh, and and one that if we had good information on, on what areas had terrapin populations, you could require people in those areas to, to, to use TEDs. Or if they didn't want to spend the money to, to revise their trap, then they could fish a little deeper or fish in another area. Uh, but it's, it's pretty costly now to put a trap in the water. And there's... <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry to I, I gotta play devil's advocate again. I've I've experimented with BRDs a lot, and I've made a lot of them, and I can make about 30 of them in an hour. So, and it's just the cost of buying some nine gauge wire. So, I can equip a crab pot for less than 30 cents. So, the argument about it being too expensive. If you buy the top me excluders that everybody is handing out, yeah, it gets expensive because they want a buck a piece for the things. But, you know, watermen are resourceful. They know how to save money and they can build their own and, and do it fairly inexpensively. Um, I'll kind of add to what they're saying. This is also, it's, it's going to, it's a state by state level. It's not, we can't, this group can't impose regulations region wide. This, this is not a regulatory group. So it would be a state by state level, and each state has different regulations con concerning terrapins. For instance, Mississippi is open for harvest as long as you have the right the right license. So there's different levels before it gets to the fishery side that that that, that the terrapin group needs to get through before we can make any decisions like that. And uh, just as Ryan and Harry were saying, you know, it, it is a specific. There are specific areas that that we need to. Uh, <clears throat> put our efforts into rather than the whole fishery. Um, that's just it's just not applicable to to require somebody to use something that's that 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 they're not going to be doing any damage to the to the, to the population, especially like they're saying deep water. And I know in Mississippi we have very localized populations. Hopefully, with what we're doing with this uh, reporting system, we'll find those out. We'll find the areas that they're not located in the areas that they are, and maybe find some new locations that aren't historical, but it's, it's real hard to, to impose regulations where they have no effect. Sorry. Um, so Laura Piccarello, Audubon Nutrient Institute. Um, so another factor to consider when you're thinking about using a device like that is that, and this may not be an issue in some states and in some areas, but in Texas, I think it would be an issue when you have a crab fishery that's also utilizing bycatch of stone crab. 
in a lot of areas, and that's probably to some extent in Florida, even though you have a directed strong crab fishery. So I'm curious, Glenn, is that something that's being considered while they're doing some of these bird um, tests as to what other bycatch species may be excluded? Because that's probably something from a lot of our work in Texas. We hear that um, stone crab is a very valuable bycatch to them and it helps supplement the fishery and that could be an issue. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, um, that's why uh, Tiffany Harper is, that's what her, the focus of her, uh, she got a SWIG grant to uh, examine the fishery and, and bycatch was one of those uh, areas that, that uh, she was going to look at and assess that and find out what the impact would uh, would or wouldn't be, and she can uh, she's she's here if if you wanted to ask her about it uh, later and find she's got a, a the study um, abstract, but uh, bycatch is one of the things I think um, <clears throat> we, you know the some of the crab meetings that I've been to where it's been brought up before that to put a, a bird in the, in the trap. And it usually comes down to the the money part, and and them not wanting to f because it's another burden. Uh, and yeah, it's always tricky. It's always tricky to kind of impose a cost onto somebody else, you know. And uh, that that was one of the issues that, that we that seemed to come up again and again. So I know that some people I know that uh, Tracy Floyd uh, paid for it with a paid for the devices at one point and handed them out for free. Maybe that might be something that people could look at, is get funding to pay for that, that kind of stuff. Take the burden off of them, but, you know, just to make it easier. But, yeah, I don't have any answers. I just, but, yeah, we're, we're looking at all of those, all of those questions of bycatch and what, how that would affect their revenues. Uh, Rick, so when do you see your pilot program going online, and uh, how are you ensuring you get proper participation from the crabbers? Well, um, it's actually going to go online tomorrow. We're going to start signing people up um, and getting them in, in into the system. And um, we, we've got a select group of crabbers that are eligible for the for the funding through through a myriad of licensing. Um, but uh, when they when they go out and they participate. Um, they're, they're going to get paid to do so. We're, we're contracting them to, to, to do that, and we're going to verify their trips through through trip tickets. And so if they went out on this particular day before we before we pay them for that day, they will be, uh, they'll have to be validated through the, through the trip ticket program. And I, I it's, like I said, it's a, it's a pilot program. We're just testing it out. Um, I'm I think once we explain it to them, then then they'll understand that this is necessary, and, and it, they they need to give us the, the information and not you know fudge it. And if they did, if they see a terrapin, not say it, or if they don't see it, you know, we we want to know the zeros just as much as we want to know the ones and twos, where where they're at and where they're where they're not at. So I think they'll be they'll be more than willing to participate. So something that I think we've been emphasizing with this session is the opportunity to collaborate and also um, share information with each other. So I'd like all the panel, this is kind of going to be in two parts, um, but the first part is are there specific types of information that you need from the Terrapin research community that would help you? So I've been hearing um, habitat data as something and specific population data. So if you could maybe talk a little bit for each of your states and then for the Gulf region, if um, you can summarize a little bit better. But what are some of the inf types of information that are either already available or for people who are thinking about planning studies going forward, types of information that would be valuable and helpful for you? I think I know you and I have talked about this before, but you know, if if we're going to try to move forward with any specific regulations concerning TEDs or no take of terrapins or what whatever it is, we gotta have gotta have information. We gotta have you know the population is is declining. This is where it was, and this is this is where it is, and we just we don't have that currently have that information. So 
and then again the hot spots thing you know where they're at but having population estimates as of where they're going how the population's reacting to whatever's going on will be very helpful on a management side to to make these decisions you know similar to what rick said um you know having an idea about uh, about their distribution uh, you know the distribution of, uh, of of suitable habitat would go a long way um, you know also uh, further further defining the uh, the role of predation on uh, on on uh, terrapin population limits um, you know because what you know let's say everybody uh, requires requires uh, TEDs throughout the th throughout the whole industry if they're still going to be the you know if that's not going to help at all then then it's hard to hard to justify that uh, uh, that, that 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 cost um, but you know more more or higher resolution information about predation rates and different types of habitats and you know throughout the regional uh, or throughout the region anyway uh, would go a long way So along those lines, um, you know, I've, I've talked about needing population information, that sort of thing, but also to contextualize how a lot of our management decisions come down. Um, we don't always have one tool in our toolbox when we look at a population. Um, all that data can go into looking into management strategy evaluations where we put it all on the table on balance where you look at the information from mortality from birds or, or for the reduced more fishing mortality from BRDs. You look at the predation from upland habitats, whether it's from raccoons, hogs, fire ants, what have you. We put it on balance with habitat loss. We put it on balance. That way you can come up with something that is, will allow you to most effectively impact that population. And that's why data and population data and location data, all of that is so important to us. When we deal with single species, whether it's blue crab, stone crab, or shrimp, we very rarely go in with one tool and evaluate one tool. We try to go in with a suite of questions about what management would be appropriate. And that way it's defensible when we come either to speaking with stakeholders, whether it's the public, whether it's a commercial industry, um, whether it's just concerned citizens, that we have vetted all, all the tools that are available to us. And that's why I think there's enough interest in terrapins. There's enough focused interest. I think by having us all speaking about what our state needs are to be able to navigate, whether it's the management system, the politics, the what have you, um, these are tools that we, we need help to generate, and we're glad to participate in these studies to help generate that information so we can look at it from all perspectives. Because, yes, traps are a portion. We know some terrapins are caught in traps. There's a mortality rate associated with that. But I, I think we would all feel more comfortable going into any type of recommendations having everything sitting on balance with that. And, and I think one, an, another point is, is that what another elephant that's sitting in the room is that if we all have take of terrapin, we haven't spoken about what impact that has. We're all assuming that it's a guy and his little kid going out and picking up a terrapin and putting him in an aquarium at home. But we really, I, I'm not that well versed in our marine or, or in our um, take of terrapins as far as those activities, what people are using them for, why they're harvesting them, and what volume are being harvested. And so that's another thing that would be very important to go in on balance, to know that there is or isn't a large take of terrapins just for recreational use. And so that, that's where, as a biologist with a state, as a researcher, it's, it's data-driven and making sure that we have concerted efforts with a little bit of funding that we all have to go down the road. So I'd encourage any of the Terrapin Working Group, any scientists out there, to, to contact us and see how we can help go down the road to, to affect those ends, whether it's whether you're proposing research or you have ongoing research. We're all willing to participate.
uh, just for Louisiana to answer your question, it'd be, you know, same thing that, that Rick touched on, be population assessments, um, habitat uh, delineation, figuring out where those things are most prevalent um, so that we can, you know, if it's necessary to direct um, conservation efforts, really. I have a question. Is anybody doing a, sur a population survey on the t uh, trying to trying to find out what the number of terrapins are in any of these different bay systems across the Gulf or across the region? Because I think if someone were doing that, um, doing having a tagging study or something, uh, you could possibly look at doing a a small area where you implemented uh, birds, for example, and then if you can you can show that it's a, it's working um, with the population it would would be something to work with but i don't know if i don't think there's anybody doing that that i'm aware of so some of the work that i did in maryland we sort of did the opposite of that and looked at what the take in crab pots is by using the tall crab pots that I showed you in this in my talk. Um, and the, the take rates, if you go into an area where there are terrapins, are high. So the sort of a, a general rule of thumb in an area where terrapins are you know, present um, is about one terrapin per five crab pot days. And so that turns out, you know, depending on what the mortality rate, which is completely dependent on how frequently the, the traps are checked or what the duration of the soak time is and the ambient temperature of the water, the impacts can be pretty substantial. And I give you some statistics there where, you know, you can have as much as 75% of the population be eliminated in one year. So one of my main premises about the impact of crab pots is based on the fact that in three or four years with a crab pot fishing effort in an area, you can extirpate that population. It's gone. And if the, as long as the crab pots are continue to fish there, there may be a terrapin that shows up once in a blue moon in a, in a crabber's crab pot. And, and, and I've talked to both recreational crabbers and commercial crabbers in Maryland who say, we never catch terrapins. And yeah, because the crab pots have been fishing there for 80 years and the, the turtles are gone. They've been gone for a long time. They were probably gone within the first five to 10 years that crab pots were there. And there's, you know, the the one wayward terrapin that ends up wandering into that area and gets caught. Um, and so that's why, you know, I'm probably being pedantic and, <laughs> and, and asking you guys, but what I really like to see is a consensus from all of you saying that there is an impact and can we work together towards trying to do a regional thing where we, you know, Let's use BRDs. It's a no-brainer, at, at least from my perspective as a terrapin biologist. I have a question. Um, are there behavioral differences in populations? Does anybody know? I think so. Yeah. I think some of the diversity of habitat um, uses that we've seen just in today's talks clearly demonstrate that there are behavioral differences. You know, it's in the, the, the Lenark Reef, that's a really cool example where you can go up and use that technique of, I call it rolling rack, where you look underneath the rack line. We only catch, when we do that technique that they use in the Lenark, we only catch individuals that are a year to two years old in Chesapeake Bay, and all of our, all of our older individuals are fully aquatic. They, you know, the only time we see them on land is when there's occasional basking and then females coming ashore to nest. So there, there are distinct behavioral differences that occur among populations. And one of the reasons for that might actually be because crab pots have worked as a selective agent favoring those different behaviors over, you know, however long 
crab pots have been used in those regions. Um, I think that probably the short answer as to why not is substantial pushback from from the fisheries. Um, that is the reason why not. It has to be able to withstand court challenges. Um, if you have no data to support the action, um, then it's not going to stand. So I, I don't know. I don't. I think that's maybe the elephant in the room, and I don't really know why um, we can't just say that out loud, that the reason is pushback from the fisheries. Fishermen do not like regulation. Um, they may have the perception that the excluder devices are going to reduce their, bike, their catch, and that may be enough for them to um, want to oppose it. I think that if the conservation lobby becomes as strong as the, the fishing lobby, then um, then that's what that would help move it forward. But um, in terms of, of a region wide um, policy, I think that that's that's not realistic because they are it's done on a state by state basis. Tracy Castellon, Florida Fish and Wildlife. I'm coming to you next. And I'm just, I'm going to say one thing as I'm coming over um, to get back at your question about specific population studies. One of the resources that the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group can provide is information on who the researchers are in each state. So we have a very good relationship nationally, but specifically in the Gulf of the people who are involved in terrapin research. And so it's really easy for us to put any of you or, I mean, that's part of what we're doing is making those linkages. But it's really easy for us to put people together um, for specific states on both sides. So if there are terrapin researchers in a specific state that you need to hook up with, or vice versa, if there are terrapin researchers who want to know more about how to talk to the folks who are doing management, that's part of what we're doing is making those connections. And, you know, Tom um, gave an example with his proposal. It's a very collaborative and open group. People are very willing to work together. It's not like um, some of the other fields where there's a lot of competition. And so it's very open. It's very easy to get in touch with people. People are very responsive and very willing to work together. And I think, you know, that goes both ways, um, that everyone's really willing to talk with one another and share. So that's definitely a resource that we can provide if there are people that you're looking for in your state or in a specific area, then we can point you in the right direction of who those folks are. Hello, I'm Jennifer Fry, and so I'm with DMR, but Coastal Preserves. And um, you were asking if anybody is trying to work on population data, and we are doing for uh, pretty much, we have five different coastal preserves that we are managing, and I'm doing predation surveys, we're doing um, hatchling releases. So we are trying to work on it. It just takes a little while to get some of that population estimate data. But I did just want to say that we are trying. So. And there are people okay. in each of the Gulf states who are working in different areas. Hi, I'm Ashford Rosenberg. I'm also with Audubon Nature Institute. Um, I just kind of want to come back to a point about fishermen not liking regulations. And I think that that's not entirely a fair statement because you see a lot of Fishermen groups, like in Louisiana, we have the task forces, and they do acknowledge when there's a problem and try to work together to create regulations that work. So I think, you know, that goes back to what these guys have been saying, is that if we have the data that says that there is a problem and we can create something that does work both for fishermen and to conserve the turtle populations, I think there is a path forward to do that in these states. So, I mean, that is, you do have a point that, that there will be opposition to it, but I think that blanket statement may be not quite as may not be quite be fair. And I will say that, that just, just from what I showed in my presentation, there, there's no opposition when, when you encourage people to volunteer to use these, these turtle excluder devices. They either do or they don't, but if you approach them that way, there's, there, there's no opposition and they're much more apt to do so rather than fight it. So we've had some pretty good success doing that. And I think, you know, other states if, with funding available could also, you know, go on the same lines. And just to, just to your point about the, the fishermen pushback, I mean, 
you're, you're right. There is going to be some when you're uh, talking about folks' livelihood. And I think in your presentation, this, there was a minimal reduction in the crab harvest. Well, I'd like a show of hands of anybody in here who wants to take a minimal reduction in their paycheck. You know, and I think that's that's where you're going to get some pushback. Minimal, no matter how much it is, is a little bit off these guys' uh, livelihood. So just to keep that in mind going forward. So following up to asking what some of your needs are, um, I'd like for y'all to share what some of the resources are that you have available. So for example, the maps and the link to all of the maps being available online, Ryan, that you gave as an example. Um, if there are specific resources that you have that you think would be valuable that folks in the Terrapin community might not know about yet and could share those, that would be really helpful. Um, well, as, as far as resources, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you where we're, we, I mean, as a blue crab fisheries independent monitoring program, when you have 2,100 miles of straight coastline and your budget's $50,000, it's, I think it's putting that back on balance with everybody. This is not, we don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars at our disposal to do research and do same thing, but it, the same thing goes with the Terrapin community. You're asking for grant money. You're out there working on grants. A lot of the time, we don't hear about those where we would be glad to collaborate at no cost, bring the weight of the state to whether it's support you know, or resources. We have a lot of resources we can bring to bear. They're, more, they're not dollars we're going to be able to give out, but a lot of times we have staff that we can work together to make a contribution that's at no cost or as in cost sharing. So I think those are the things, but no one thing to know is that we're in the same boat financially, I think, with the Terrapin researchers that are out there throughout the Gulf and Southeast Atlantic. But it's a common ground where we can work together to get things done because we can get pretty creative. I mean, the, the Lenark study we showed which was a year-long study, cost us less than 75000 was a specific grant we got. But we had a lot more than that brought to bear just because we had the resources at hand. So that's what I would offer for, for the type of resources we have available, other than the small grants and things that pop up. And most of those we don't know about ahead of time. A lot of the time it's opportunistic things that pop up. To add to that, we... All of us, all of us have, all states have <clears throat> probably long-term data sets of fishery independent, fishery dependent data that may or may not have, you know, terrapins caught within them. But I know um, that they, it's, it's, it could be useful, you know, in as, as far as in terms of looking at historical information as to where they are, maybe even help out in population estimates. So I would encourage. Um, the, the Terrapin Working Group to contact their, their marine fisheries uh, office agency in that in their state and have them look at you know their their fishery independent data long standing fishery we, we have some we have some data going back to the 70s you know and that that could be helpful in population estimates. Christina, it seems to me. We neither one of us really know what we're doing. I mean, here is a lady from DMR who comes up and says they're doing this at Coastal Preserves. So it would be most helpful if the group could supply people in the individual states that work with terrapins and within a state, because it's the fisheries are managed by state, to put together joint committees with terrapin. And, and management and, and, and the scientific community um, so that we're all on the same page. And it would be easier to prepare proposals. Uh, we tend to have our pet funding agencies, and I'm sure your funding agencies are probably uh, a, a different uh, uh, group. And I think to me, that approach, we could make some headway uh, because it's going to take money. 
and it's hard for our particular agencies to say, well, we want to do some turtle research on the side, but um, working together to put together some some probably fairly inexpensive proposals, again, using some of the state resources because they're in the field anyway, uh, would, would be a good start. And for states to start working within states to address issues. Steve, want a new subcommittee? <laughs> <laughs> Just another point in terms of resources, and I think you guys have started to address this in the sense that you're doing some, you know, runs directly with commercial fishermen. I know some of the academic programs are, but the conversation that's being left out of a resource here is the fishermen themselves. And I think when you come to them with regulations that you've done through your academic university or your lab that doesn't actually engage commercial fishermen in the process, they're much less likely to believe your research or believe that it actually is effective with regard to how they fish and the how, how they behave on the water. So, you know, thinking about when you're t talking about these bird studies and things, not just working on your own, you know, traps and nets and your own individual studies, but being able to actually incorporate the fishing community in the conversation will go a long way in actually getting them to understand what you're trying to do and maybe give you ideas of how they're being impacted or could be impacted and why some of these issues of maybe looking at not a blanket regulation or these area specifics would be a little bit more clear on both sides. So. And, and that's something the state representatives can all help with because we all work with the industry. We have worked with them. Um, we have good relationships with them. Uh, we know a lot of the, the guys that are willing to do things at no cost because they're interested. I mean, a case in point, uh, we just finished a, stone, uh, a project developing coal rings for stone crab traps. Now, this was a, it, we funded it ourselves through our own efforts of going out. In the very end, we involved commercial fishermen to the, our advisory panel. We had commercial fishermen willing to drill two-inch holes in their stone crab traps, not knowing how it was going to come out and insert the coal rings. They went out, they fished them for part of the season, were very impressed to the point where they began developing themselves because it reduced bycatch, reduced undersized crabs, it was less work. But it wasn't just because the state went in and said, we did this study, you guys go trust us. We actually built the bridges and went in, bought the rings, gave them to them, worked with them on how to collect the data for, for us. And there was an amount of trust that was built there to the point of what I think is an alternate way of looking at a lot of these fisheries is that you have to go hand in hand down the road because a lot of the time the, the projects that come up from inside the industry are the ones that are going to stick because you've had that interaction already. You've already had the vetting to where they can, those guys have fished more stuff on the water and tried more things and can figure out what works and what doesn't work for them if there's a common goal established on the, on the front end, if it's terrapin reduction or there's a benefit to that in the market of a sustainability benefit or something else that they can see a tangible link to, they'll work with it and take a design that if it comes out of most of our scientists' head, it's pretty good, but you go put it out in the water and let it break and let it fall apart a few times, they'll, they'll turn around and tell you how to build it the right way, you know, if they're engaged and if they've bought into it. And so that's the thing that we can also help with as other projects come down the road. So we're about at the end of our time because we need to get out to get to lunch. It starts promptly at 12. Um, so I just wanna take a moment to thank the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission for hosting this session. Um, thank all of the participants in the room here and the folks online. Um, also, thank you for all of our logistical support and web hosting for this morning. Um, it went very well and it was really valuable to have that additional opportunity to let people listen in online. Um, Thank you again to all of our speakers for your time and your effort being here 
And I think it's been really valuable for us to have an opportunity to get everyone in the room together. I think there are a lot of opportunities for collaboration and sharing of information. And I also think that there are a lot of opportunities for um, researchers and managers in other regions to see the work that's been done in the Gulf region as an example for ways that they can get ideas and also um, inspiration for how people have been working together across the Gulf region. There's really good collaboration across the Gulf states and I think that's something that can be an example for other regions for terrapins and other types of fishery management. So. Again, thank you everyone for your time and thank you for the effort that you're doing um, for terrapins and the blue crab fishery and for your willingness to work together on this. And I guess I have no final comment. I just wanna again thank the Gulf Council who provided us the, uh, the go-to webinar access. Um, we had about 10 people participate remotely. Uh, turning over. We've had a total of, we figured about 50 people come and go out of this room. So I think it was well attended. I hope that it was informational. Um, we are going to continue to do these general sessions uh, at each of our meetings. Next March, we'll be meeting somewhere in Florida. Destination is not, not fully determined yet, but we will have a general session at that time on our small grants program for oyster aquaculture. So we will have a half day session there as well. Um, I hope that we can continue this in the future. Uh, and I thank you all for participating. Thank you panelists, thank you presenters. You've come a long way in some cases. Um, for those online, thank you. If you need to get in touch with any of the folks involved with this workshop, um, you can find on the agenda their names, their affiliation, and I think a simple Google search will, will provide you that information. If you need more information, you can contact us at the commission office and we can put you in direct contact with any of the folks uh, who are here today. And with that, I thank you all.